get that, by the way. Act up. Yes. All right, team, it's after 11, so let's get organized. I sure know. All right. At least it gives me a goal. Exactly. That's a good thing. All right, we are gathered here today for a discussion on continued discussion on our um, proposed budget. Um, today, uh, the, the focus will be on um, the compensation portion of the budget. However, we do have um, you know plenty of time allotted for this work session. So if there are other questions related to other sections of the budget, feel free to. Um, also bring those forward. Um, we do have, I think, four hours allotted. I'm not sure that we'll use up all of that time, but we should have plenty of time for board member questions. Um, I do want to thank our budget team for um, sending out two board members um, just this morning the uh, fact sheets that back up the proposed budget. Um, those are um, you know, more in-depth background information on all of these budget items, not something that we expected board members to have you know, gone through in any detail before the work session today. Um, so you do have that um, available as of this morning. We also have the full proposed budget that I believe was posted on um, Friday afternoon. So that is out there on, on board docs publicly posted. So um, today we will... Um, get started with our um, presentation and information on compensation. Ms. McCarthy, did I forget anything? You did great. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> All right. So with that, I will turn it over to our budget team. Good morning. Um, if you can go ahead and go to page two, that basically is the work session agenda. We're going to provide uh, fiscal 23 market comparisons um, for teachers um, at their career earnings, the annual employer cost of teachers uh, with salaries and benefits, and then some comparative information about teachers, bus drivers, family liaisons, and IAs. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about our retention strategies, and then finally some recruitment and hiring strategies that will be provided by Dr. Wilson. So if you go to the next page, this um, page reflects the fiscal 23 career earnings of a teacher with a master's degree. Um, there's a lot of steps, so we've collapsed them into um, groupings of five um, for all of the surrounding uh, divisions that participate in WABY. And we rank fifth out of nine divisions um, in career earnings, um, looking at it this way. ERF ERFC is not included in this because that is not salary. This is just a look at salary schedules in fiscal 23 for the surrounding divisions. If you go to the next chart, um, in the WAVY guide, which is um, also uh, attached to the, the board item today, um, which is where largely most of this information comes from. There's a section on salaries and benefits. Um, the assumptions are that the teacher, a teacher salary of 65,000, um, of course FICA, VRS, or Maryland Retirement System, um, when we're talking about Montgomery County. Um, ERFC, it's got a 401A match that Prince William provides and a 403B match that Arlington provides to its employees. Um, and we rank third of ninth in the WABY divisions if you look at salaries and benefits combined for a teacher making $65,000. 
The next chart is the fiscal 23 master's lane um, teacher scale market comparison. We are at 94% of the market midpoint, which is below the desired range of 95 to 105%, um, which was our, our stated uh, range back when we first started looking at salary schedules, I think in 2015. At the max, we are at 92%, so we're outside our desired range there. And then at min, mid, and max, we rank seventh, ninth, and eighth um, out of nine divisions. The next chart is the bus driver market comparison. Um, we've done quite a bit of work on bus driver salary skills over the last couple of years. Um, we enhanced the pay in 22 and re redesigned the salary scale in 23. So um, they look pretty good. The starting salary is at 109% of the market, the midpoints at 103%, and the max is at 99%. And we rank second, fourth, and fourth out of nine at the min, mid, and max. Family liaisons uh, market comparison, we uh, enhanced that salary scale uh, in this current year as well. Their starting salary is 105% of the market, the midpoints at 102%, and the max is 100, 100%. And at the min, mid, and max, we rank third, fourth, and fourth out of six because two divisions uh, did not respond, and Montgomery County does not seem to have a like position. Um, we probably could, they probably have something similar, they just call it something else. Um, and we can, we can reach out to them and try to get that. But for, for now, we just have the six to compare to. The next chart shows the CIS market comparison or our instructional assistance. Um, recall that we had a strategy for the instructional aid scale enhancement to bring their salaries at 50% of the bachelor's line of teachers and that the final phase of that was implemented in fiscal 22. At the max, we are below the 95 to 105% range um, at 92%, and at the min, mid, and max, we rank fifth, sixth, and sixth out of nine. Also included in the fiscal 24 budget is um, a, a salary scale extension of one step at the top of all scales. Um, we recognize that there are retention challenges everywhere um, and definitely in public education, and this will provide another year of step increase eligibility for employees at the top of the scales. The next chart shows the salary scale extension and the employees that are at the top of the scale and would not receive a step increase without this uh, being included in the budget. Um, it's about 9% of our total employees. About 50% of them are teachers. Um, we do have fewer steps than the surrounding divisions. Um, Loudoun has 30 steps on its teacher scale. Prince William has 30 steps on its teacher scale. Arlington has 31 steps on its teacher scale. We have 24 in this current year and 25 that is proposed an additional step in fiscal 24. Also, um, on the retention strategy for the salary scale extension, um, you know, we, we would like people to delay their decision to retire. Um, right now, we have about 2,000 FCPS employees who are eligible to retire uh, from VRS, and FCERS, which are less than 1.0 uh, employees uh, participate in the county's retirement system of FCERS, um, our trades people, our food services people, uh, transportation, family liaisons, all of those groups um, participate in FCERS, and about 1,100 of those members are eligible to retire by December of 2023. The state has also stepped in with um, to try to help divisions retain their staff, and so the governor's budget, when it was introduced on December 15th, funded a 1% retention bonus um, Employees are eligible for the bonus if they were employed by FCPS in fiscal 23 and remain with us in fiscal 24. It cost us about $19.9 million to provide a 1% bonus, retention bonus. We have about 24,000 employees that would be eligible for that. Of the $19.9 million, $4.3 million comes from the state and $15.6 million is uh, the local share. 
Another thing that we're looking at as far as retention strategy goes is um, reintroduction of the work after retirement program. We are exploring a potential work after retirement program. Um, that program would only benefit legacy participants, uh, tier one um, ERFC and tier two EF ERFC would not be uh, applicable. They would not benefit from this program. Um, right now in the legacy plan, we have 544 individuals that are uh, that would be eligible immediately. The average age of that group is 63, and they have an average service of 27 years. We have not yet um, calculated the cost impact to provide that. Um, in fact, we, you know, I, I was reluctant because we didn't have a cost to even talk about it, but I know there's great interest in that. So we thought we would at least tell you what we know, um, and we're still exploring with the um, actuaries um, what that would cost us if we provided a program to incent those that are eligible to retire to stay a few more years with FCPS. For fiscal 24, um, you know, divisions, what they're, what they're proposing for their compensation is a highly guarded secret in every division. And we have uh, four divisions who have not yet released their budgets, and that's Arlington, which will come out on the February 23rd, uh, Manassas City and Manassas Park City, both will be released on February 14th, and Prince William on February 1st. So we don't have any compensation information for fiscal 24 about those groups. Um, but a few of the others we do. Alexandria is doing a 2.5% MSA and a 2% bonus. Falls Church is doing a 2% MSA and a step increase plus other compensation initiatives all combined um, will meet the 5% that the state introduced because, of course, nobody wants to leave any of that state money on the table. We, of course, are doing a 3% MSA, and the average step is 2.22% for a total of 5.22%. Loudoun is revamping their salary schedules, um, so the step varies among employees depending on the changes that they've made, and they're also including a 2.5% MSA. And just for the record, steps are movement on the scale, and MSA is applied to the schedule. So if it says, you know, 3% for Fairfax, you could go to the fiscal 23 salary scale, multiply every line item by 3%, and you would get the fiscal 24 salary scale. Um, Montgomery County, you know, they're subject to collective bargain, bargaining and union negotiations, and so they are at 3.35% MSA uh, plus step increases. And regionally, divisions, I know Loudoun especially, appear to be focused on top of the scale incentives as, as we are. And the next part is recruitment strategies. And I can talk a little bit about recruitment strategies. Uh, Dr. Wilson is on her way. Her calendar inadvertently had Luther Jackson as uh, the work session today. So uh, she... <laughs> Is it Luther Jackson? So a little grace for her as she comes in because I told her that we we're here in Gatehouse and so she'll be uh, coming back here. Uh, but with our recruitment strategies, we have uh, hired uh, more than 200 teacher residents this year uh, as we've tried to increase and ensure that we have individuals uh, uh, in front of our students at the beginning of the school year. And we'll be working to move those teacher residents from uh, the teacher resident program into qualified positions. Uh, we're also uh, uh, beefing up our recruitment strategies. Uh, we've just begun and started the recruitment season this spring. Uh, we are uh, at two different events today. We were uh, talking with our recruitment director this morning, uh, and he was part of a meeting and was actively getting off so that he could have conversations uh, with candidates. Uh, we're working with Longsdale Publishing, the VCL Preparation Program, which is the Virginia Com Communication and Literacy Assessment Program to ensure that we have teachers um, uh, who are qualified to work with our students. We've implemented a Food and Nutrition Services Career Opportunities Recruitment webpage so that we can uh, increase uh, our individuals uh, coming to work with our students in our Food and Nutrition Services program. We've expanded our presence on social media and our advertising campaigns with uh, clear communication plans to uh, bring in more teachers and, and share more about the good things about Fairfax County with our candidates coming to us. Uh, we've begun the implementation of recruitment and hiring surveys so that we can get a better sense 
of uh, what our candidates are looking for as they're uh, thinking about and have many more opportunities and options to them today uh, for teaching. Uh, as part of that conversation this morning, uh, we're looking at a variety of candidates and uh, today at our fairs and in speaking with our uh, coordinator, he shared that uh, the candidates that they're looking at today at the job fair uh, can average between uh, 12 and 13 offers from other uh, school systems that are uh, at the fair today. So it's a very different market than it was in the past where uh, candidates have much more choices available to them. We have to be uh, nimble in our ability to offer contracts to those individuals and follow through and to help them understand why it's important for them to uh, teach and work in Fairfax County. Uh, we'll also uh, talk a little bit more and if there are questions about the, uh, the FCPS teacher commitment program where teachers uh, would uh, talk about their commitment and express their commitment to continuing to work in Fairfax County. And we're also uh, strengthening our partnerships with our Troops to Teachers program. Next slide. As part of the meeting that I talked about this morning, we were focused on our hiring strategies. And one thing that we're implementing this year, which is uh, different than what we've done in the past, is implementing centralized hiring for our schools. Uh, currently, uh, we have uh, all of our principals have the ability to uh, receive resumes from human resources, receive resumes from uh, teachers outside of the system, and we're trying to narrow that process so that there is a clear uh, line of resumes going from HR to principals. And so uh, that's a piece that we're working on as well as working on those centralized hiring efforts. We're creating a team of administrators from our uh, Title I and high firm schools who will uh, be working to hire as many individuals and teachers into the system as possible. Uh, and then we'll have uh, the first right for those individuals once we get them processed within the system. We have prioritized hiring for our Title I and hard to staff schools and centers. And as part of our process this year, uh, there will be a point where we'll allow all of our principals uh, to interview for staff. Uh, and then where we still have vacancies in our Title I and hard to fill schools, we'll be placing individuals in that second phase of the process so that we don't have teachers remaining in our pool and have vacancies within our schools. Um, I shared a little bit about those educator hiring teams that we're pulling together uh, and uh, we'll be providing some training uh, in the coming weeks for the hiring teams so that they have a better understanding of how the process works. Uh, we're currently working uh, on an international hiring effort. We have a, a multi-pronged approach to our international hiring efforts uh, and are finalizing a contract with uh, a vendor participate learning uh, who uh, works with bringing international candidates uh, to our school system and they will remain with us uh, for two years and work with our students. Uh, we're continuing our substitute incentives for those high volume days. We've seen an impact and, and we appreciate the board's focus on providing additional funds so that we could provide those additional uh, funds and incentives for our substitutes on those days where we saw uh, more of our staff uh, taking days off, uh, as well as uh, we've implemented a site-based substitute program uh, where in our schools where it's uh, very hard to find substitutes and get substitutes to take jobs, uh, we have permanent subs placed in those schools uh, and uh, our principals are very grateful for that approach. I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Wilson, who has joined us, and she wants to talk about uh, this last slide on retention strategies. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and good afternoon. Um, we are um, partnering with OPLE uh, to plan supports for teacher residents. Um, many of our teacher residents are entering the profession with little to no uh, preparation um, or experience in the classroom. And so along with OPLE, uh, we are working to uh, make sure that these individuals have the support and care that they need uh, you know, as they walk into our classrooms. So we're providing input into those supports and development um, that OPLE can offer our residents. For career ladders, career ladders are an organizational 
formal pr um, process designed to encourage employees to move up in their careers. While there are currently career ladders in place for some positions such as uh, AAs and custodians, um, we want to expand those opportunities and promote retention within uh, various positions within the district. And for administrator succession planning in partnership with OPLE, we're working with OPLE to create a process for administrator succession planning to build and development of administrator candidates. Uh, HR is also participating in a leadership pipeline workshop on February 16th, um, sponsored by FABC, AEA, and HEA affinity groups to assist in bol bolstering the leadership pipeline with diverse administrator candidates. And uh, the, the return, we're going to return to the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging cohort work that we were doing um, prior to uh, the pandemic. This cohort um, will assist schools in exploring ways to recruit and retain teachers of color. Uh, this work began, as I stated, uh, a couple of years ago, um, but then it shifted to pandemic-related responsibilities, as many things did during that time. Uh, but we are excited to be picking up this work and moving forward to expand um, to, a, uh, to additional schools within the county. So we're very excited about that. And then uh, there's the development of operational employee onboarding. Uh, we know that there's uh, quite a bit of interest and need in that area. And so uh, we are working, um, well, we've already created a template uh, for operational employees, and uh, we're expanding that to um, multiple um, operational employee groups. And then finally, state interviews. State interviews, um, I remember uh, this was a conversation that we had um, at a work session when I entered uh, FCPS um, last school year uh, in June, and uh, there was quite a bit of interest in uh, the use of state interviews, and we are implementing state interviews um, this starting this year, and we do plan to keep these in place for the next school year. Uh, so that will, of course, inform us as to um, what things um, our employees feel are benefits and uh, reasons that they choose to stay with FCPS. And uh, we are looking forward to, um, to executing this, implementing, and getting this feedback so that we can make sure that we put um, those things in place um, for our employees and encourage re uh, retention of staff for the years to come. You know, the board members, you know, with a majority consensus would like to um, amend the budget. Um, you, you maybe need help with language on your amendment. Um, and of course, we would, we would need to cost it. Um, so if you have any budget amendments, uh, if you could get those to me via email by February 10th, we will um, help you write them and cost them out. And then we will post them to board docs um, by Friday, February 17th. And the last chart, of course, is just the budget development calendar. Um, the next thing that, that comes up is the Fairfax County Executive will present his budget on February 21st. Um, and then on February 23rd, we adopt the advertised budget and convey that to the county as our needs um, for the upcoming school year. That's it. Thank you. We have lots of questions. So we'll get started, I think, with um, Karen uh, Corbett Sanders. Oh. No, it was me. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, really focusing on employee compensation today. I'm sure you're going to hear from my colleagues that it's more than just uh, salary and that we have to look at other conditions uh, associated with it, which all result in an impact on the budget. Uh, I know that there's going to be some conversation about ERFC, so I will hold off on that conversation. But I do have a couple of questions. One, what is the current vacancy rate we do we have? 
uh, for teachers, IA, each of the categories, including principals. And secondly, um, when we look at this, I'd like to better understand what the budget impact is on staffing when we look at something that is incredibly important for the success of every classroom, which is having planning time for our teachers, especially in elementary school. And so uh, if we were to add in a specific chunk of planning time, either as a um, extension of, of working hours for employees in elementary school or by having additional staff in elementary schools, that would be very helpful. And then I have some other questions, which really are uh, regarding the retiree program and why tier one and tier two uh, retirees of the new system are not eligible for the uh, return to work program for them, uh, for retirees. And my other question um, really pertains to the cohort model, which I think is important, but I'd like to understand um, or ensure that that cohort model also addresses the needs um, for attracting and retaining uh, Hispanic teachers and Asian teachers, which have been underrepresented in the past. So that's a start. If you want to freeze my time and people can respond. I will begin with the cohort work. Um, and so um, the cohort work does in incorporate um, any uh, teachers of color, so that would include Hispanic, um, Asian, any uh, teacher of uh, color to expand uh, diversity within the, the district. So it's not directed in any one um, particular group, but it is across the board. And I also wanted to, um, to go back and also stress the importance of uh, the belonging piece, uh, and that's why this work is directed um, in our schools because that's indeed where the work, real work um, happens. Retention. Uh, it's, the, it's definitely a retention piece, and so um, we are excited about the, the start. Well, the, um, going back to this work because it, it, it is indeed important. And, and we can, uh, there was another question about vacancy rates. We'll get those uh, and provide the vacancy rates to the board um, as of today. Uh, and we'll, we'll ask staff to pull that together. You had a question about ERFC, and I know that there's going to be conversations with the ERFC uh, or about uh, our retirement program. For our Tier 1 and Tier 2, as the uh, actuaries were looking at the calculations, it's actually more beneficial for our Tier 1 and Tier 2 retirees to remain um, in the retirement program and to remain working without pulling dollars out as you look at um, uh, their ability to maximize their earnings over a lifetime. And so for those who are in the legacy plan uh, who might see diminishing returns on their retirement the longer they stay within Fairfax County, if you're in the Tier 1 and the Tier uh, as you stay in Fairfax County, I'm sorry, that's not the question. Oh, I'm sorry. The question is regarding getting retirees to come back to our classrooms. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing to create incentives for retirees to come back to our classrooms? And um, that include the conversation was about tier one and tier two retirees. Yeah. Correct. And so for the work after retirement for the tier one and tier two, um, we would recommend that those individuals not retire, but then stay with us. So that's what I heard with the tier one and tier two. I'm talking about people who have already retired. Oh, yeah, I, I, I see. So, so, so you're talking about encouraging those folks you're to right. come back. Uh, I know that uh, we currently have some legislation uh, in Richmond that's looking at uh, shortening that the time uh, where folks have to separate from Fairfax County or from employment mm -hmm. uh, from six months to one month. And so that would be one thing that we would be looking at for those recent retirees to encourage them uh, to come back and work for us. Uh, the biggest issue with retirees is that um, once you do come back to work for us, 
um, it, it, you would still want to be able to uh, receive your retirement. And there's another bill uh, in Richmond now that would also uh, look at allowing those individuals to continue to receive the retirement benefits while working for us full time. So as a go back, um, I would just suggest that some of our neighboring jurisdictions are already having their retirees come back and receive their retirement funds. So I don't know how they're doing it, but we should be looking at how they're doing that to be able to be competitive um, or as a next step. And then additionally, you talked about how we um, attract and retain teachers. Uh, it's more than just salaries, as I mentioned, planning time and class size. So if you could provide us with a comparison of what our class sizes are and what our planning time provisions are compared to neighboring jurisdictions, that would be very helpful in understanding um, how we can be competitive there. And then my third area, once again, on attracting and retaining is in the principal pool. We had major changes to our principal pool several years ago. Many of us have uh, expressed concerns on how that worked. Um, do we have, uh, as you proceed in this area, what are we doing to take the lessons learned from that process? We're actually doing work on that um, as we speak. Um, we're having conversations surrounding um, the principal pool process um, and also hiring. Um, and so we're working um, across uh, departments to work on on that very um, thing and then so we sh we're expecting to have a product in place um, very shortly uh, so that's expected this school year and one of the aspects of the principal pool is looking at those outside candidates and so we're looking very closely at uh, how we bring uh, external candidates uh, into the system and what those requirements would be. Ha had a very robust meeting yesterday with our region assistant superintendents and uh, cabinet to focus on uh, making uh, immediate changes to that process so that we can uh, recruit the, the best and brightest candidates for our principalships. My time is up, but I would expect that the board would have lessons learned shared with it on the principal pool. And the other questions, can you provide us that data on planning time and class size? Yes, yes, we, we will work okay. with our uh, Thank you. colleagues in other jurisdictions to get that information. Ms. Keys Gamara. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate the efforts to try to get us a lot of information. Um, I haven't had a chance to review what was posted, I think, this morning. Um, but the, the overall category that I want to talk about um, is the strategy of how we present the budget and how we can make sure the community understands that. So um, I, I'm going to start with um, those, some of the goals, all of which I agree with what Ms. Corbett Sanders said, but rather than looking at this as you know, a year by year process, have we thought about um, presenting, I, first of all, identifying these concerns such as planning time, et cetera, um, but also putting together the budget in a three to five year um, time period so that we can help the community as well as um, the people who are funding us, the Board of Supervisors, the state, et cetera. These are the goals that we have, and this is the investment that it would take. So that's overall, that's as I looked at the documents that I do have, I, I wondered if in this particularly competitive environment, whether we may need to adjust how we're approaching these questions um, to try to make sure that we can present that. And, and so I'd like to ask Ms. Burden if that is something um, that is appropriate um, moving forward. Well, I mean, we include a, a, a fiscal forecast for a, a few years in the approved budget every year that does have a five-year look um, as far as that goal goes. Um, we also... I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but we also um, hook up with the county and do community um, discussions about the budget with them where people can ask 
questions and we provide uh, greater information. Um, but those are by request and we don't actually have a schedule yet. And those usually occur in March. And what we present to the community is the advertised budget or what are the increases that are being proposed. So I guess um, I, I'm aware of that. What I'm looking at, for example, I'm seeing compensation right now as a, as, as a urgent need to address to make sure that we not only remain competitive, but that we can retain and attract um, staff members. And so if we were not only having a three to five year uh, look at things, we would also have rationale as to those investments, right? And I, uh, Dr. Reed, would like to identify what some of those topics are. For example, we heard questions last night with respect to our STEM investments, right? Um, and so it, it, it seems to me that these two things go hand in hand, the strategic plan, which would say this is what we anticipate with our budget, which would say to the people who are, trying, who would, who are considering FCPS, this is what I expect. So I think it's a combination of what you are saying as well as what our superintendent can say. Sure. I'd yeah, love no, a response. I, I'm sorry? <laughs> I'd love a response. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> I agree it's important. Um, I would also say that we have to look at the existing staff and how we can perhaps think about um, either expanding or realigning some of the duties, right? We've talked a little bit about the ability to do STEM, uh, which, I mean, who doesn't love STEM, right? And um, math and the science. Uh, but we have all the AART teachers as well in classrooms, or they're assigned to school. So the ability for those staff maybe to support STEM education as well. You know, so how do we... Uh, layer the training, the professional development, and the expertise so we have all of our staff able to deliver. But to your point, I think, Ms. keys Kamara, it's the idea of maybe rolling this out over time. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard a lot about athletic trainers last night as well. I don't know if we can do all of that in one year, but maybe we look at our largest schools to start. Or do you know what I'm saying? Like, I think you're asking a great point. What of this work is part of an ongoing plan? Right, and so if, if it helps, I'm happy to ask some budget questions with respect to, to some of that. As I listened to that conversation last night as a mother of um, three athletes, right. I know those injuries have a, a direct connection to coaching. And I'm, you know, at what point do we want to talk about our compensation as well as training right. for our coaches, which is integral to, to that concern. Um, so, well, and I would also add our theater and uh, performing arts stipends, right, and how those line up with coaches and the amount of time put in to bring a production up, right? I just think we see what we value by where we move our funds. So I think there's a lot to be said for how we might be thoughtful about that. So my, my point is, as we look at that, and let's say, for example, we heard this last night about coaches. Right. We've heard about other areas at other times. But have we put forward the rationale for, one, our community to understand why this budget is growing? Because it is a strategic plan throughout a, a longer period of time. So that's kind of the idea I wanted to pitch this morning. And I'm happy to all offer questions to try to hone that out. Thank you. All right, thank you, um, Ms. Cohen, followed by Mr. Frisch. Yeah, happy to follow that. I know I've got a budget question in about the cost for the 25 ATC 2s. Um, so looking forward to that and seeing if we can work together. Either you all um, would be ideal, right. but if not us, um, to try to figure out how to do that. And I think, you know, to your point about even having a long range goal where we say these are the five schools where we start and the next will, you know, I, I just having a plan going forward would be great. Um, so I absolutely second that. Um, some, a few questions are, and a couple of comments. One, I just, um, Prince William's going to put theirs as a 5% increase and a, and a step. Um, so we're going to fall farther behind um, Prince William. You know, I think last night we heard a community member say, and, I, and we all feel it at this table, about that we 
in Fairfax County, we have to lead. And I think, you know, it certainly hit when he said that um, about really being the best out there. And I, I think, you know, a question is, and I know Megan has mentioned a few times ERFC, if we're recognizing that that is not attracting folks here, then maybe it's a conversation that we need to have with our staff about what that looks like. Obviously, if we, we cr contribute, what, 6.25 or something, 6. Point, what's our ERFC? So if you're to look at the employer contribution over the, a 30-year career, it's about $120,000 additional uh, that uh, Fairfax County provides uh, for compensation. But, but yearly, we put about 6 point, what, 4% or something? What's the? 6.44%. Okay. Um, and so if we, if we look at that, the cost to that is that then we can't use that money, obviously, for other things. Now, to us, as a system, we worked really hard to make sure that there were two streams of retirement, and people do very well. In fact, we have friends who retire and say, oh, my gosh, I make like $300 more a month than I did when I was teaching. Um, and that's wonderful. We want that. But... Do we need to have those conversations if salary, if that's what's keeping us so separate, if I am trying to find a job in Fairfax County, I am looking at these charts. And why would I go somewhere where we're fifth, ninth, eighth? Um, so, you know, that's, I just think we're just going to keep shedding people. Um, and the elementary planning time, I think, I don't know if it, Karen, Karen or Karen referenced, um, that I think the idea, too, is that these districts are not created alike. We already know that we have FRM. Our FRM percentage alone would be the sixth largest school district in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So what our teachers are dealing with when they're in the classroom, when they're outside of the classroom, this is different than other places. Not to knock what those teachers are doing. They're killing it, too. But we know that we have different expectations so on our teachers, so we got to do something different. Um, I did want to ask the bus driver, um, I don't know, did we ever get the compression scale info that you were going to send to us? Um, we did not um, provide a copy of that. It was an informal um, review of our scales. And um, the outcome is that there is indication of compression across multiple scales, not just one in particular. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that was... Um, evident. I just, when we're looking at those bus driver and we talk about the median driver, median step, um, like most of the, our median driver is actually on step four of 20. So it's not the median, it's the median of the scale, but not where most of our employees are. I know I'm over time. Sorry. Chris? Ms. Tolan, if I could just make a couple of comments just because this is of great interest and um, we have budget questions about it and we will answer those formally. But just so you know, currently we have 25 certified athletic trainers at a cost of 2.9 million. In addition to that, we provide a supplement or stipend for fall, winter and spring at the high schools funding for that and that's at about a half a million dollars. Um, so if we wanted to add a second AT, that would be uh, another 2.9 million, but perhaps we would not have to budget for the supplement. That's about a half a million. But that'd be an ATC two, right? Which is a lower pay scale. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think several of us have already talked about the need to think in a multi-year kind of time frame about what our goals and our priorities are um, when it comes to compensation. Also, steps. I'm, I'm curious, have we ever done an analysis to see what ways we could um, use our funds to bring people up for missed steps? Well, of course, it's, you know, it's the cost that's prohibitive. Of course, um, I know it's the cost. Yeah. But we can give people a step increase, and that applies to everybody. Um, but, you know, we heard from uh, an educator last night who's missed five steps in his career. Is there any pathway that we could come up with that over time Correct. would recover those missteps while also slowly moving people forward? 
I, it, I, I doubt it. The cost of a step increase and everyone in Fairfax missed step increases during those years. I mean, in the time that I've been here, we didn't get step increases for two years. Um, but step increases average, uh, you know, about 55 million. And so the numbers get really big fast. I mean, even if you assume average step about 2%, then uh, at 55 million, just to try to even give two steps, so you're already over 100 million um, in addition to what we've already assumed. What about at the end of their career? Is there a way to help recover some of that at the end of a career? Somebody may not miss as many steps as somebody else based on when they join the division. Um, and so maybe they retire with a, a larger income as a result of where they landed here. Is there a way to do this at the end of their career? Not necessarily the entire amount, but if I've missed five step increases because of when I started employment here and I was a loyal employee for my entire career, is there something to be done at the end of their career to increase their retirement benefit? No, it's just based on compensation. The steps, what it's what we call it, doesn't matter. I mean, all of the divisions around us use step and grade um, uh, philosophies for, for teacher salaries and, and other staff. But I understand that. What I'm advocating is that is there another way of doing this, right? Is there something that could be done to somebody's end of year, those last three years that we peg things off of, to increase their retirement benefit based on missteps? It wouldn't be for everybody, just be for people who have X number, you know, whatever they've missed. I'm using a lot of my time on this but question. But it's everybody, because everybody missteps. I understand I mean, that. It depends on where you started, though, right? Is how many steps you've missed. No, I will, I will send you a more detailed question laying out what I want rather than spending two and a half minutes on one question. Um, all right. Um, I'm considering a follow-on motion. What are we currently doing to assist uh, educators and others um, in the master's lane or who have previously received uh, tuition reimbursements? What are we doing to help make sure that they are enrolled in and maintaining their eligibility for public service loan forgiveness through the Department of Education? That would be an HR question. <laughs> and I'm not sure if we have the right people here to answer that. Um, I will attempt to make an attempt at that um, question. So the federal loan forgiveness um, program is, um, of course, outside of FCPS. And so, um, you know, of course, if there's anyone who is eligible for loan forgiveness, then we do whatever is necessary on our end to, um, to verify their employment, which is required as a result of. Um, so we do nothing to get them into the program other than what's legally required? Correct. All right. I will be talking to everybody about what we can be doing to, to elevate that as a possibility for our employees, um, because most educators were denied admission into the program in the previous administration. Uh, inadvertently, it's become very difficult for them to be in the program, and it could save them a lot of money, which benefits the quality of life that they have in our system. Um, up, uh, on ERFC, um, I appreciate the comments about what we could be doing to uh, with that money. I would not be in favor of limiting or reducing um, the robust offerings which have already been trimmed back quite a bit over the years uh, that we provide for, for retirement. But I am curious what we are doing to help sell this benefit as a, as a boon to um, employees within our system. Um, you know, I, for one, can tell you that naming something after the letters of an, for an acronym is not the way to sell any product, um, you know, uh, except for maybe OJ. Um, uh, Oh, God. Um, but um, what are we doing to make sure that people are clear and aware um, that this is a huge benefit to them? And I realize that's not something you can tell somebody when they're 22 years old, um, but it's certainly something that gets more and more important the longer they're with us. So we can uh, certainly ask Eli Martinez to provide an update when he does his uh, annual review of ERFC with the board. 
both Ms. Burden and I sit as trustees uh, on the board and uh, receive regular updates with regard to their uh, efforts to uh, share information with our employees. Uh, they have a huge marketing campaign to help uh, our employees understand that there are two scoops on the ice cream cone. And so the first scoop is uh, VRS and the second scoop is ERFC, which is that benefit. Uh, they work hard to explain uh, the benefit of that through their advertising efforts. Uh, we've seen an increase in the number of employees who have logged in to review their ERFC benefits. They've changed uh, much of their model at ERFC to provide uh, retirement uh, counseling and advice to employees throughout their, their entire employment with FCPS. Uh, prior to some of these recent changes, you could only uh, have that discussion within your last five years uh, as you were close to retirement. So on that end, they've done quite a bit to help uh, our employees understand the benefit, help employees understand what those dollars mean by logging into the ERFC Direct. Uh, they're currently engaged in uh, an RFP to look at a new system that's a little bit more user-friendly for people to understand and help with that retirement planning. Uh, we also have uh, ensured that we have ambassadors in each of our schools, uh, and, and they're called ERFC ambassadors. They're employees who can help uh, employees within the building understand more about their benefits. They're highlighted. Uh, the, everybody knows who they are. And so if you have a question, if I'm in the legacy plan and I you know, have a question, I can go talk to the uh, ambassador. New people, how do we use it as a recruiting tool? And, and this so, is all for people that are already here. And, and so with that, we also use that, that language and that information, and uh, it's with our recruitment teams today. Uh, we have a team at William & Mary and a team in Maryland, and so they have uh, information about ERFC and are able to share that information with new recruits coming in. You're exactly right that it's hard for a 22-year-old to see the benefits of um, uh, retirement. I know that when I was that 22-year-old, I kind of went like that. And now that I am uh, 29 years in, uh, yeah, now that I'm no longer 22, uh, I, I had wished, and we've had these conversations, I wished I had had somebody who was a little more my age help explain those benefits, because at that time, I didn't want to hear it from somebody who was you know, telling me how I should spend my money and what I should do with it or what the benefit was. So those are conversations that we've had at ERFC as well. I want to go back. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Frisch, Dr. Anderson, followed by Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, I appreciate all this information on the retention and recruitment efforts. So most of my first round questions would land there. As we know, it's a struggle to attract and retain the Title I and special education teachers. So I'd like to hear a little bit more in terms of the centralized hiring that speaks to that. And I also want to revisit a question that I posed it seems like almost two years ago now, how can we um, look at the packages for those individuals a little bit differently? Because as Ms. Cohen said, she's definitely right. There's a classroom and then there's a Title I classroom or a special education classroom where you have to run to the gauntlet before you get to the instruction. So is there any space for us to reconfigure or specialize the compensation packages to attract individuals in those two areas? We've had some of those conversations and are looking at uh, what the impact might be for using uh, those Title I dollars to provide stipends to uh, individuals who work in Title I schools. Uh, and, and so uh, there'll be more information to share with the board on that. Uh, again, we've, we've started those conversations. Uh, Amy Miller, who is our uh, director for Title I, uh, has been working very closely with HR and finance uh, to see if that's something that we could do uh, in terms of differentiated compensation. And the centralized hiring. And, and the centralized hiring, uh, again, the focus is on our Title I and our high FRM schools. Uh, we are finalizing the, the hiring teams uh, as we speak, a lot of as we speak, because we just were always working in HR. Uh, uh, but we are getting the names of those administrators who will be part of those centralized hiring teams. And as I shared before, as they are bringing in candidates into the system uh, and we're pushing those candidates out as part of the pool for 
hiring, uh, those individuals who are on those teams will have uh, first access uh, to those candidates as we look at the vacancies within their schools. Okay, and I also want to just share that here. I know last year, Dr. Reed, there was a premium placed on making sure that the classrooms were staffed first before all other positions. I hope we're taking the same approach to how we're filling all of these positions that, that are now entering the budget. Um, I know you mentioned it just a little bit ago, um, the athletic trainers that we're looking at. In the proposed budget, um, where we have some um, athletics for middle schools, would that also mean that we would need to include trainers at those levels? I, <clears throat> traditionally, middle school sports, I don't, I think it's really mixed in terms of whether athletic trainers are required or not required. I think whatever the standard FCPS has uh, for trainers would need to be implemented for middle school if there is a standard for athletic trainers at middle school. But since we haven't had middle school sports, there might not be. I just um, want us to be two, behind the yeah, eight ball on this because injuries are injuries and they could happen anywhere. Well, we did try to start with two sports that were non-contact, um, cross country and track. So with the hope that, I mean, the sports with the higher injuries would be our uh, contact sports, which then I think it's a moot. Clearly, we have to have training, Just so athletic we could training support. Be thinking a little bit ahead. Oh, okay, great. Um, is there any space for us to repurpose the one percent retention bonus? Because I know the bulk of it is coming from local funds, with four point three coming from the state. Do we have any flexibility to accept that and kind of repackage it to kind of meet some of the um, concerns that are being raised around the table? I, I, I don't think so. The, the language is very clear that you have to be employed by the school division in the current year and, and retained in, in fiscal 24 in order to receive that 1% bonus. So it's pretty prescriptive um, as far as the state goes. But, you know, the General Assembly, you know, may make changes to that. We're, we're a long way from a state budget, too. So we'll see. Okay. Thank you. If we could just kind of keep that in mind. My next set of questions are around the troop-to-troop -troop teachers, the international teachers, the teacher residents. One of the things that we're beginning to hear from parents is that they're not feeling the confidence in the preparation of those individuals to stand in front of their children and deliver instruction. Can you speak to what are the requirements? How are we ensuring that they're high quality teachers? And I know the resident teachers are slightly different because they work with a, a licensed professional. Thank you for that question. Um, so the, the minimum um, requirement or qualification is a bachelor's degree. Um, and that would enable um, an individual to um, at least go back and take the coursework that's required for a provisional license. And that's what we're working to assist uh, these individuals in, in doing. Uh, with tr the troops to teachers, um, in many, many cases, colleges and universities um, have a partnership with um, troops to teachers, and so they provide uh, coursework for those individuals so that they are actually uh, coming into classrooms with uh, the necessary um, coursework uh, needed for a license. These are already licensed individuals? Some are. Some are already licensed individuals. So, um, and the ones that are not licensed are still able to deliver instruction without that license and without a teacher to be working alongside of them? If they have a bachelor's degree, then we would treat the individuals the same as we would a teacher resident, which they would have a teacher, a certified uh, licensed teacher, um, working alongside them and making sure that you know, they have what they need in, the, in terms of support in the classroom. But for all of these uh, situations where individuals are coming into our, our buildings, into our classrooms without a license, they at least have the uh, minimum requirement so that we can get them into coursework um, that would get them to the place of, of licensure. For example, there are some teachers or some teacher candidates who um, would like to perhaps teach math. All that would be required of that individual is to pass the praxis. 
Um, for elementary, on the other hand, uh, an elementary program is much longer. And so uh, that individual may have to take an, um, a, maybe six courses. So with the teacher uh, resident program, we are placing them in the classroom and while they're taking the coursework and getting um, preparation for um, that's necessary or the taking the coursework necessary to become licensed or to receive the provisional license, which is what our goal is to get them to the place of provisional licensure, which is the same as, um, not the same as a 10-year license, but it's the next step towards a 10-year renewable license, if any of that made sense. It does. I, the point of it is I want to be sure that we, I know that this is a teacher shortage. I know that there are a lot of challenges. We still have to have highly qualified teachers in front of our kids. And I, I'm also worried in terms of how we're being strategic in terms of placing these less experienced persons. I, I've seen the turnovers at Title I schools. I've seen the turnovers at schools that need the better teachers. So Dr. Reed, I would love to hear your ideas in terms of how do we place our better, best teachers in front of our neediest students. <coughs> so one of the um, directives in place right now is we're hiring early and first for our Title I schools. And um, Mr. Smith reported yesterday that we've hired 51 teachers last week. And the direction from my desk is that they go in our highest need schools first. But are these qualified teachers or are these? They are. Because that's are my license, not just graduates the body, in but education. is it the most expert body? Right. These are, um, we're hoping, effective bodies and licensed uh, educators. I will say, it's, if our salary lags, um, and we get later in the hiring season, we're going to struggle to find highly effective educators to hire. But we're out hiring early right now, um, far earlier than we have previously, with the intent of placing uh, staff in our Title I schools first. And in terms of that early season, so here we are in January, and we um, ha have uh, filled the pool with at least 40 qualified candidates today. Uh, so we've hired 51 last week. We have 40 in the pool. We have uh, the first of our spring recruitment trips started today. Uh, we're, our hiring teams are coming on board. Uh, we are focused on you know, always be hiring in Fairfax County, and we're going to uh, hire every qualified teacher that we can. And, and then at the end of the day, as we think about providing principals the opportunity to interview those candidates, uh, if at a certain point they have not uh, filled the vacancy within their school, we'll begin placing those candidates. We also understand that enrollment changes happen during the course of the year, so we'll have D-staffs uh, that will place in vacant positions as well as uh, the ability to place those teachers who are transferring from one school to another. So you've got all of that happening at the same time, and our focus is to uh, not say no to those teachers who are qualified. We want to grab you as soon as we can uh, have you in a pool and then ensure that you are in uh, a classroom uh, come July 1 with the priority being our Title I and high FRM schools. So, Dr. Anderson, I also want to share that one of the <clears throat> other strategies we're looking at is uh, the distribution of our student teachers. And as we began looking, many of our student teachers are not student teachers in Title I or hard to staff schools. And we know that um, the likelihood, if we can support our student teachers and they get to know our staff, they're more likely to want to stay in the school they student teach. So another um, project we're looking at is making sure we're distributing our student teachers in some of our toughest to staff schools as well. Okay, I have follow-up questions with that, but I see that my time is up. First of all, I really appreciate the questions that everyone, my colleagues, are presenting, but I would hope that maybe we can focus back on the budget first because um, this is a more robust conversation we need to have about premier workforce, no question. But Dr. Reed, I have to tell you, um, I am continuing to struggle and figure out where in your administration there's a focus on analytics. Um, when I look at uh, slides three 
and slides um, five in particular, and, and you can even go with four, if we take the 6.44%, which thank you, Ms. Cohen, for putting a fine point on because your staff should have done that, it, as my basic back of the envelope shows me, we become number one in first year teacher salary. We become number one in overall career earnings. When you add in the 6.44% that we are giving to our employees every single year. We just put it in ERFC instead of into their paycheck. I would really like to understand why it's taking a school board member with a background in social work to look at these things because we are really harming employee perception, employee morale. People are talking about wanting to leave us and we're not putting out numbers to help them understand whether you're here for us for a year, whether you're here for us for a career. Secondly, we did as a prior board survey our employees. What do you want to do about ERFC? Because it is 6.44% a year. That can go directly in your paycheck. And the response we got back with the prior board was people did not want us to touch it. They wanted us to keep it because it's like a 401k. So we have to help our employees understand that we are giving you the most competitive pay in the region. Whether you're a single high school district like Alexandria and Falls Church, which frankly is another conversation I keep having, the heavy hitters right now are Loudoun and Prince William. The charts that I, myself and others asked are proving the point that Loudoun is not in our, in our um, area of co competition. Prince William, but when you add in your RFC, now we're the number one dog in the business. I don't understand why your team doesn't see that this is so crucial. Help me understand what am I missing here? Because this is the second budget discussion in a row that we're gonna not only be talking about just our budget and the salary scale, but to every question around the table, how do we continue to track the best? It won't be from these PowerPoint slides. Okay, thank, <clears throat> thanks, Ms. McLaughlin. I, uh, Mr. Smith, you indicated you had a, a response to that. I, I think the, the question is, if the salary charts on the PowerPoint don't include EF, ERFC, and ERFC is a benefit, a salary benefit, then we're missing an opportunity to be, you know, to, <clears throat> excuse me, demonstrate our competitiveness. Certainly, and so, when we look at ERFC, it is a retirement benefit, and so when when you look at overall compensation with a carve out for ERFC, yes, the the what FCPS pays per employee is their overall paycheck, and then a carve out for a contribution to ERFC. Many have t talked about it like a 401k, and it is. It's a defined benefit plan that we pay into, just as we pay into VRS. The, the thing that I've heard from, from staff and from the, the gentleman who spoke last night, who we've had conversations with in several meetings, there's the difference between the dollars that people have in their pockets currently versus the dollars that they're going to receive down the road. And that's, that's the biggest question that's out there. And so we, we can highlight the overall compensation and uh, the overall dollars that FCPS is investing in, in employees. And, and while we have that conversation on a regular basis, what we still hear is that, yes, and I'm looking for more dollars in my paycheck versus you know, that overall compensation because I don't understand what that looks like for me down the road. And so we're working to help uh, educate employees about that ERFC benefit and what the value of them will be for that ERFC b benefit uh, as they retire. But uh, I hear what you're saying, Ms. McLaughlin, because you're talking about what FCPS is investing in that particular employee. They just don't have access to that $4,000 on average per year that we're investing in them and won't have access to that until they retire. Is there a way, Marty, to demonstrate, because that's, I'm guessing if it operates like a 401k, it's before taxes that it's taken out? Or am I mistaken about that with the ERFC? Because there may be a tax savings as well that we're, you know, that we're not calculating. Um, 
Yeah, that 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 is pre-tax. Okay. Hmm. I wonder. I think we all understand what is happening. I wonder how to portray it in a way that um, makes more sense. So it is to Mr. Frisch's point earlier as well, more of a recruiting tool because it's money in the bank, right? Um, but I hear what you're saying too, Marty, that it's not in my pocket today. It's, it's not in my pocket. And for those mid-career teachers who are coming from other jurisdictions, they get it because they're at that point of, oh, I have that better understanding of I, right. I am paying 3% into a retirement plan. My uh, employer is paying. What we do annually in March is we provide an annual compensation statement to all employees so that you can see what the employee contribution is to their benefits and then what FCPS's contribution is to their benefits. So in March when you get that, I can see that Fairfax County uh, is paying me this salary and they've also paid this much money toward my retirement plan. And we provide that to all of our employees. We've been doing that now for maybe six or seven years. Uh, that's one way that we help inform employees of what that employer contribution is. Uh, again, for those employees that are coming to us directly out of college, it's hard for them to understand what that benefit might be down the road. So Marty, I know this is probably a question that's been asked, but I wonder, <clears throat> I wonder if there's a way to give an employee a choice, right? Because regardless, the 4,000-ish that we're putting in is a budget. I mean, that's a serious budget consideration. So we can't, but it's kind of this quiet, silent, behind the scenes allocation that people aren't recognizing. So I'm wondering, is there a way, if I'm a new staff member, I could say I'd like to participate in ERFC or I would prefer not to until XYZ year, or I'd like to only participate in it to this point, not to the, right? Like, I just wonder if there's any flexibility because we're putting the money in. And if there's a different way to put the money in that's more attractive to staff, I think we're all in on that, right? It's the finite sum of money that we have to distribute that we're sitting with at this moment. And, and so I think that down the road, you'd be looking at plan design changes. And so we currently within ERFC have three particular plans. We have the legacy plan, tier one, tier two, uh, if that's a direction that the board would want to entertain, you would then have a possible tier four plan, or we'd have to go back and look at the overall plan documents that by um, uh, the, the decree and the resolution that allowed the, and the ordinance that created ERFC was a, an employee shall uh, participate. We do know that for VRS, uh, as we have different tiers of VRS, that employees have the ability to put more money into their uh, VRS retirement. They, they can choose uh, in the hybrid plan how much of their salary that they would want to put in. We don't currently have that option within ERFC as the employee gets to choose. Um, but, but those are discussions that uh, we could certainly entertain with uh, Eli Martinez and have that conversation when we have the ERFC presentation. So if the ERFC was salary and not ERFC, where would we sit on the chart? <coughs> well, do other systems have ERFC? No, no. we're the only ones. Um, yeah, the, the chart on page four shows the value of ERFC because, you know, if you, if you look at the other charts, we don't compare as well as we do if you include employee benefits in. And we jump to number three um, out of the um, seven, uh, nine divisions displayed here if you include employee benefits on page four. Um, yes, it includes all benefits, retirement, retiree health, um, other retirement. As I said, the Arlington has a 403B match. Prince William has a 401A match life insurance, health, dental, vision, um, all of those items are included in the chart on page four. And because of that ERFC contribution, which is about $4,000, we do rise to a rank of three in that review. But I mean, the documents, the other documents are purely based on um, other school divisions and our 
salary schedules. So, you know, we, we have a huge desire to have great integrity around our data. We can't just add $4,000 in and say, oh, we're not really paying $61,000, we're paying sixty five dollars because you're getting this $4,000 ERFC. I think the other divisions um, would protest our characterization of that because it's not salary, it's an employee benefit. Right, but it's, <clears throat> it's significant. Right, I mean, and it's something if we're going to use as a recruitment tool, I wonder how best to to show it in a transparent way. Yeah, we do. I mean, we, you know, making it voluntary would certainly have an impact on the fund and the level of of funding they get to invest. Um, it would also result in us having two re, two salary schedules for each group, one with the one where they opted not to take ERFC. Um, and at the end of the day, we want them to take ERFC. It is a good thing. Um, taking that money, I mean, you may, you would very, probably very well have a bunch of 22 year olds would say, no, give me my $4,000 now. But in, in this instance, I think that it, it's a good thing if the division takes a paternalistic approach. The ERFC it provides a great benefit on the back end. They just don't see it at a young age. And I've been around long enough to know individuals who were able to opt out of ERFC when it was first offered. Uh, they were half-time teachers or they chose to opt out at the beginning of ERFC. And then as they were getting uh, closer to retirement, they were ruining that decision uh, because they didn't understand the benefit at the time and were having to work longer in their career because They'd been in Fairfax for many years, but started their careers. And I remember uh, quite frankly, or vividly, a kindergarten teacher who was half time at the beginning of the career for 10 years and didn't opt in uh, when she had the opportunity to and had to work longer uh, because of that. So I only have six seconds left. I'm just going to say that I will talk about this more in the go back. But Dr. Reed, this is where, again, I'm concerned about how our administration does the analytics and provides the crucial analytics for employees to understand this. And the bottom line is taxpayers are saying to us, why are we falling behind? And we're not. When you take everything it costs us to hire an employee, that chart alone shows that besides Alexandria, a single high school district, we're pretty much right there with Loudoun County as the top for total salary and benefits. There's so much more here. I hope we can dig deeper, you guys, because this has huge impact, not just on the budget, but attracting and retaining employees. Um, Ms. Sizemore Heiser followed by Ms. Somesh. Thank you, and um, many of my questions have been asked, but I, I want to pick up a little bit where Ms. McLaughlin left off, and it sounds like there's a, a clear need to have more of a conversation. I know we have a report on ERFC every year, but maybe time to revisit the conversation around, I think you mentioned, Ms. McLaughlin, that um, our, our um, employees have been surveyed some time ago to ask about their opinions about ERFC, and they were in favor of it. I'm wondering if that conversation needs to be reopened, you know, given the change in um, teachers and the need for teacher staffing, maybe that would be, I don't know, but it may be something to look into. I don't know if we're going to solve that today, but I, I think, you know, when we look at ERFC, can they have three lines, opt out, full opt-in, half opt-in? I don't know. It is difficult because, let me ask a question. It, it's not a um, match contribution from my understanding. It is approximately, and you said 4,000, that's regardless of how much the employee puts in. So... You know, are they required to put in a certain amount? No, it's That's based on I income. The example okay. that we gave is average, um, but it's 6.44%. Okay. So if, if you're making more than 65000 then it would be more than that. That's what I thought. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify. When, so, you know, I think for the conversation here, the budget conversations, I think it would be helpful um, to the chart. I mean, I did see the chart about total compensation. It might be helpful to have some more narrative around that. Mm -hmm you know, around both the, the chart on page three and the chart on page four, because it is a huge benefit that Fairfax County provides that does, um, that is a little more unique, although I hear you saying that Prince William and, and have some sort of contributions 
I don't know how they compare, but it might be helpful to have a narrative around what we provide and then a comparison, a retirement comparison. Here's what Prince, if other jurisdictions do that. So maybe an apple to apples comparison around benefits as well as salary. So people can see here's your career earnings, just salary. However, here's the difference in benefits. Let's break it down. Here's how much your average health insurance call, you know, health insurance. Here's your average retirement, what we contribute. So then, and then a slide that kind of shows salary and benefits together, because I think it is difficult with, the, with this narrative. If we're trying to recruit and retain teachers and they see these slides, I think they're going to say, well, why am I not going to Loudoun? Why? And Loudoun's not going to tell them, well, you know you're leaving ERFC, right? Like, you know, they're not incentivized to do that. So I think it's important to break this down because our public is looking at this. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't have this conversation given the change in, in um, the economy, the change in, in teacher staffing. I would love to see some numbers around... Um, I've heard anecdotally of teachers leaving for Loudoun and Prince William um, and administrators leaving as well. And I've heard anecdotally about fewer teachers going into teacher prep programs. But I'd love to see some numbers around that, right? Because that can then help um, bolster what we need to do around compensation that may be related or unrelated to our surrounding jurisdictions, but mostly related to the fact that we, the supply and demand issue. So I think that's an important piece to talk about when we're looking at salary increases. Um, and then with my, I'll need to go back, so I'll just give my four seconds up and go for my go back. It's hard for us to know where people are going when they leave us. Um, we've, uh, we did provide some information about, the, or have talked about the number of individuals who may have just left and taken their ERFC retirement but not taken their VRS. And so you can assume that perhaps they've gone somewhere else. But we do know that we have individuals who are eligible at different times, and so they may take their ERFC and leave, and then perhaps a month or two later take their VRS. So it's hard for us to know uh, where they've gone. Uh, we do have some data on our uh, retention rates, uh, our turnover and retention. And so we're looking at about it, um, an 8.7% turnover rate for our teachers uh, for the 21-22 school year about a 3.6% for school-based administrators and 7.5% for our operational staff. And so, uh, and we've seen uh, those numbers uh, increase for uh, teachers uh, since the 2019. We had uh, less turnover at that time. Many people were sort of uh, staying in place. The pandemic was, up, was upon us. Um, coming in at 2019, 2020, we had a 4.8%. Then we saw a 7.3%, and we can provide this information to the board. But that gives you a sense of uh, increases that we've seen over time. It is just hard for us to know where they're going. I'll take my four seconds to say that's fair, but whatever you can provide that helps with that narrative would be helpful. And going back maybe 10 years even. Thank you. Uh, thank you, staff, as always. Um, and I want to shout out uh, Dr. Wilson also and uh, her work on the HREC to, to really be collaborative in trying to identify retention and recruitment strategies. Um, with that, I, I guess I want to build on some of the points made. I, I do think part of it is a perception issue, you know, we, not selling what we have in, in clarity and uh, pervasively enough. But I think some of it's also a reality issue. And, and that's kind of where we have an opportunity here to, to think of how we might change. Um, it, the employee compensation piece does strike me as a place where our system is bleeding. And, and the more we kind of prolong it and push it, the, the worse off we're going to be. It, it, it's like five years from now, if we look back and we're like, what happened to the FCPS brand? Like, how did we break? Um, COVID was a moment, but really, I think the, our decisions in the aftermath of that, including this piece right now, are, are important. And, and as I'm reflecting on this conversation and, and what I've heard from the community, it's dawned on me that perhaps even in looking at our budget, choosing that this year we're going to just invest most in this and increasing even uh, the percentages we have now, especially compared to what other divisions are doing, is worth it. I mean, this is a pivotal moment. It's something that will mark probably the next five, ten years in FCPS. And uh, I think it's worth it. If we compare, like, look at Prince William. Their strategy has been to steal our staff, right? Like, they're paying up and up. They've decided to invest there. And yeah, that's come at a shortcoming. Like we've chosen to invest a lot in building up our systems of supports and whatnot in our schools. But um, 
that that's something I think is worth doing at this moment. So I wanted to just kind of frame put put that as a big picture. Uh, not to mention, and I was just talking to Ms. Cohen, cost of living in, in a lot of these counties is actually lower than ours. So that's even worse if you consider how expensive it is to live in Fairfax. Um, so with that being said, uh, I, wanna, uh, I, I did want to ask a question about um, the ERFC piece. Is the, is the rationale here that it has a retention component, that we're trying to keep people in longer because they're going to access that money if they choose to retire? At some point, there is a retention quality of the RFC when you get to a certain point in your career that uh, your eventual retirement benefit will be higher if you stay until your retirement eligibility date. And so there is a retention portion of ERFC. Then there's a point when uh, you are eligible for retirement. We find employees who then choose to retire from Fairfax move to a neighboring jurisdiction, continue to pay into the VRS system uh, while still receiving full salary in the other jurisdiction, their retirement benefit from Fairfax County Public Schools, paying into VRS. And so the work after retirement program that we were looking at would allow employees to continue to work with Fairfax County Public Schools and uh, receive their retirement benefit, uh, which would be that money in their pocket when they get to retirement eligibility. Yeah, so I think our internal narrative on ERFC might be that that's a retention strategy, but not really a recruitment one, right? Because if people won't, might not want to stay this as long as retirement to, to in our system, is that fair? That is a fair statement. And so with that, that recruitment uh, strategy, for those who were on the board when we adjusted our scales and had the philosophy of providing more money up front, uh, we compressed the scale, so we went from 29 to 23 steps. We then uh, front-loaded those dollars, same pot of money, but you front-loaded those dollars at, to the beginning of your career so that teachers would see more in, in the first five years of their career, and then the pot changed uh, for your increases uh, as you stayed with us. That was the philosophy for retention. It's hard to um, go to a fair when the neighboring table has starting salary of Fifty-five, fifty-seven thousand dollars when our starting salary isn't there. That's that's the piece that a lot of those teachers are looking at directly out of college. And again, our our principals and administrators who are on at these fairs sit down and talk about the benefits of Fairfax. There is a, a training that all of our recruiters go through to talk about the importance of living in this area, the benefits of professional development so that we can uh, make Fairfax County as attractive as possible. Yeah, I mean, folks, you know, colleagues, I think that we're, we're in a place now where it's not even just about premier workforce. It's, it's also reputational risk. And uh, w to reverse that is going to be extremely hard, um, you know, to clean that up when we've already, like, we're already there. Let's not lose that. Um, but with that being said, I, I do want to ask, taking a step back, what adjustments have been made to the budget or the items in prioritizing since our last conversation, based on the last conversation, but also based on some of these findings and the reflection from them? So we haven't made any changes to the budget. Dr. Reed presented her budget, and uh, we are still using that as the bones for our conversation. Uh, we've provided some additional information in terms of what we've done in the past with com compensation. We talked about the enrollment increases to help facilitate that conversation with the board as we think about possible amendments to uh, the advertised budget. So I guess that being able to implement some of the strategies you all outlined, where is that coming from? In terms of the strategy we've outlined, we, we've talked about, so we're providing some information to show that where we are with including uh, uh, our benefits into the, the, the calculation uh, for overall compensation. But as you think about the folks who came to the hearing last night and who are talking about some of the issues that they're facing, uh, those that's part of the conversation that the board could consider uh, and ask us through budget questions to cost uh, so that we can provide more information to you as you're making those decisions on possible amendments. So, so there, there are no recommendations outside of Dr. Reed's budget that we have from the last presentation or from this presentation. Okay. I mean, is that something, Dr. Reed, that you plan to 
do. I, I, there are things that have come up. Like we all know they've come up. Last conversation, some folks brought things up. I brought up Esau and language and translation and other, you know, and we heard about the athletic trainers. We now know of the, the challenges we're discussing today and we're all going to come up with some thoughts around it. Right. We don't have to come up with amendments to address each of those, right? We all know that's right. So <clears throat> I'm still, I'm doing the budget while I'm learning your budget process. So one of the things that um, we, staff is costing, for example, the athletic trainer piece. Um, we also have a, a topic that I think I'm more keenly aware of too in terms of our most experienced principals and where they sit on the salary schedule. Because um, there's a significant gap there as well on annual income uh, at that experience level. So I, I'm not entirely sure about the mechanics of writing amendments or the mechanics of adjusting the budget. I've had to rely a bit on mm -hmm. Lee and Marty for that. Um, but I think it's a process, and we have questions, and if there are things we need to include, then we have to figure out how to, how to do that. So I'm open to that for yeah. sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. I know that's my time. We don't have another work session on this, right? Yeah, we do. Um, have one more? We've got to go back. Yeah. It's a whole day. No, I know, but I, I'm, yeah. I'm just responding to this. Like, if there are going to be changes that are responsive to everyone's feedback to the budget before we have to vote on it. You want to speak to? Yeah, yeah, I hear. Or they that. advertised. We do have another work session. I don't know. Maybe Lee, do you want to talk a little bit about how the process works? Yeah, the, you know, the Virginia Code says that the superintendent shall propose a budget and with the school board's approval convey that to the local governing body as an estimate of the needs to be um, for the school division in the upcoming year. So the way this is supposed to work is the superintendent proposes, the school board makes amendments uh, to things they'd like to add or take away from the budget, and then that is, you know, adopted as the advertised budget, and that is what is conveyed to the county as an estimate of our needs. Um, in, in my time with Fairfax, um, there has been a tendency to not do that at the advertised level, mm -hmm. to do it at the adoption level in May, which oftentimes ends up being that, you know, if we, if we don't get full funding, then we have to recommend reductions to align our budget with what the funding is. And then we have to cut it even further to be able to fund um, items that school board members uh, would want to see in the budget and there's majority consensus. So we really should do the amendments now because to do them at the end means we're not really conveying the estimate of our needs to the local governing body. But I'm not asking about the amendments piece, right? I'm asking, we had an entire conversation about the, the proposed budget last time. And we had all kinds of thoughts about how it could be improved or whatever. And today we have this whole presentation about additional areas that could be improved. Could not the superintendent bring fo give that reflection and come back with a, a, a better version of it as opposed to 10 amendments yeah. when we vote on it? She certainly could. Um, propose something and if a majority of you all supported her proposal um, then that it, it would be an amendment to the superintendent's proposed right. um, but yeah it doesn't necessarily have to come from you all you just have to a majority has to vote for it yeah that's so, my time I know but yeah but I would just we... say in my experience okay. over the last several years the where we have had amendments right the most successful amendments are those that have been prepared in conjunction with the superintendent and the budget staff and then you run by everyone in the board so everyone on the board understands what we're talking about so we've already discussed so much no 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 it. so i understand yeah. where you're going so um you know i'm in the process of taking last week's information we've got Ms. mccarthy and i have everything written down from today we can compile all of that and have a conversation with mm -hmm. Dr. Reed and our budget team and figure out are there particular amendments or whatever that we want to propose or move forward with. Of course, if there are other you know, board members that have very specific things, please alert us to what those are. That's what you know, um, Ms. Burden is saying in that slide. If you have budget amendment ideas, please get them to us as soon as possible. 
Right. I mean, I'd rather not bring it as an amendment. Like, mm -hmm. if it's an oversight, I, I, that could I just completely be... understand what yeah. you're saying. Thanks. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that you're taking notes to bring back and to have additional discussions. I just want to be sure um, that there will be a, some sort of consensus with what you're providing in the budget team conversations. I'm just worried that each of us have talked about a number of things. Just because I mentioned, you know, paint all the buildings yellow, it makes your list, doesn't mean that this is what everybody wants. So I just want to be sure that there's some consensus with Absolutely. whatever it is that you're going to be proposing as you have the finance team discussions. I'm, yeah, I'm very concerned about that. Yeah, I think we would act similarly to what we did in October um, when we prepared our budget motion for the superintendent. I mean, that was all by consensus. Remember, we had our October work session where we got information from each person, what they were interested in and what their priorities were, and then we put that together, and then everyone had an opportunity to, to review it before we brought it to the board table. That we did bring that to the table. I don't know if I would agree that it was necessarily a consensus, but everybody got their input into the document. That is different for me than consensus around a very specific topic. So, and I could speak with you a little bit more later if you like. So here's the way I understand how this process works and we've done it for the last few years. You've proposed a budget based on what you see as the operational needs and what your vision is right now based on you know, what we've talked about, what the prior strategic plan is, et cetera, et cetera, and this is your budget. Now, we are talking and discussing, and maybe we've got some other ideas we'd like to add into that. Those are an amendment process, because us sitting around the table, you know, I think one thing, you think one thing, well, that's not consensus, and that leaves, I think, the superintendent to be in a place of, like, what, you know, and, and it becomes disjointed at the end of the day. So I, I think we need to be careful with that. Um, and I think we need to talk amongst each other, offer those amendments, um, garner support, and they pass or they fail. But I do not hear any consensus over any one single thing here. So I don't know that this gets pushed back to Dr. Reed's um, no, I appreciate arena. the clarification. Yeah. It's just that when um, Elaine was talking about taking what she heard here and bringing it back, that's where I had some concerns that we did not have the opportunity to really reach consensus on the discussions yeah. of this afternoon and, and of last week. No, I, under, I, okay. I don't want to speak for Elaine, but I think, you know, we share those things just to remind, you know, staff that these things may be coming down the pike as amendments. Be ready or, you know, here's what has been discussed. But Ms. Pekarski, some of those are oversights, like carryovers from previous years. And I recall a previous superintendent would do that. He would bring back something that was a little bit more responsive in the following work session that had slight modifications based on the conversation or things that arose in the hearing. I don't know if he did, but for me, that's definitely a, not a good way to proceed in the budget process. So unless there's consensus that we want to do something differently, I think we need to kind of stay on on the path that has been, you know, laid out. So, yeah. Um, okay, we still have a few more people, and you'll have a go back, so, you know, you can talk more about that, Ms. Somesh, if you'd like. Um, Ms. Marin, do you want a turn? Sure. I appreciate all the questions, um, and thank you, Ms. McLaughlin, for also your analysis. Um, it was helpful. I... I have a question, it's kind of adjacent to compensation, but it's something I've been thinking about. So when we talk about the number and percentage of students in special education that we serve, I've confirmed with staff that that only includes our students who are on individualized education plans. That does not include the students who are on the 504, which of course, there are identified needs, they're just addressed in a different way and legally what we're responsible to do, but those students do require an extra level of intensive support. And so when I'm looking and thinking about staffing and comp I don't know if it's exactly related to compensation, but it is related into how we budget because, you know, our total expenditure on special ed is 20% um, of, the, of the whole budget, 689.7 million. 
I did want to share something that I, I believe I shared earlier. A few months back, I was in a uh, educator finance workshop held by Georgetown University, and they pointed out that if you have more, if a school division has more than 13 to 14 percent of their budget dedicated to special education, it requires a real thorough look. Now, I'm not saying we don't need that amount, that 19 percent, and in fact, what I'm wondering is if, if we have more need because we're not including the 504 staffing. So that's just a wondering that I've been having. Um, and I just want to put it out there formally because I think it's worth addressing, mm -hmm. regardless of how the law treats funding for the category of special education. So I'd love to just hear any thoughts on that and how that might be considered for this budget cycle. So <clears throat> I'm trying to, I know that we have enrollment, like a projected enrollment increase, which then drives a certain number of um, teachers for special education, ESOL, and general ed. So I think that's where we take it into consideration. I don't know that the percentages in the Commonwealth of Virginia, where that sits, do we get funded regardless of the percentages? In the state I came from, we were capped at a certain percentage for funds. So we do get um, state funding for special education as part of our um, SOQ formula that runs through our LCI, and that's based on just our average ADM, like, you know, system-wide, so it's not specific. I'll look at the funding formula just at a high level. Um, we do get some money there to support special education. Regardless of the percentage? Yes. Okay. And that's true for a, a bunch of things, right? Our counselors are, you know, we go above and beyond with the state funds, um, even though the state sometimes doesn't even fund its own, you know, the standard. So, you know, I, I'd like just to do more, you know, and this is another case where are we really looking at the numbers in a way that makes sense? Are students who have special needs, whether they're IEP or 504, are going to require more intensive services? So how are we staffing, you know, and compensating and hiring the people that we need? So I think that's, that's to be continued. Right. The other thing, um, I was really impressed by the um, list of recruitment strategies and all of those updates, and I'm eager to share that with the public because, as has been said, you know, we're sh we need to share our story more. And, you know, I know that the Board of Supervisors continues to be our, you know, our most um, critical partner, and I'm just wondering about a formal way to keep them up to date and for them to push out that information. When I look at the teacher residencies and all these strategies for recruitment, um, that, that came to mind. So I guess my comments are budget adjacent today in some ways to compensation, but certainly related. So, oh, the other thing I just wanted to mention, though, once again, I would prefer that when we talk about the 1% state bonus, that we that it always include that it is a required match, because if I understood your numbers, Ms. Bird, and I think we're paying 75 percent to the state's quarter percent, so I think it's really giving a lot more credit, um, and we need to say you know we are providing the bulk of that. Thank you. No comments. Okay. Um, thank you, Ms. Mayor. Ms. Darnot Kofax, do you want to turn? No, or? Fine. Okay. Um, and we have our student rep here today. Welcome. Go ahead, Ms. Togby. Thank you. Um, okay. So I have a few. Um, so I saw a bit about our retention strategies, and it had me thinking about retention on a school by school basis. So something that I was thinking about. So Title I teachers, like they most likely leave because they feel like they're disproportionately, they have a disproportionately higher workload and might not feel supported by their um, department chair, their admin, et cetera. And they might not feel like their, what is it called, their destination workplace is, isn't really like their dream place to work. Um, so is there any chance, this might be a bit out there, but it's just one of my immediate thoughts, we could help offset them by paying them more than the teachers at non-Title I schools? That was a budget question that was asked by uh, Dr. Anderson um, a couple of weeks ago. And, as, and it's basically 
staff was asked to do a national survey of incentives um, for Title I teachers. Um, and so the HR team is working on that. Um, so hopefully we'll get some good data about what others are doing for and providing incentives. Okay, and then of course, like something to keep in mind, like if that's not possible, then how do we make our other schools more destination-like? You know, you hear of schools like Oakton and things like that that are like kind of not pitch perfect, but kind of mapped out like that. Um, and then something else I was thinking about was, so what was mentioned was our ERFC ambassadorship. And I was wondering, is that a current leadership position or is that something that's about to be implemented? Uh, that's a current position in all of our buildings, and so it's a, a position. It's not a stipend position, okay. uh, but it, it, they've identified a teacher or a staff member within the building who can answer questions about ERFC and then direct okay. individuals back to ERFC if there are questions about how much money am I going to make when I retire, and what am I paying into, and what is a secondary retirement program, and should I leave to go to another county? That's mm -hmm. one of the things that our ambassadors do. If they hear okay. that Dr. Ivy is going to leave, if I'm an ambassador, I'm going to say, before you go, you need to contact ERFC to find out what that impact is going yeah. to be. Yeah, and then do those ambassadors receive any sort of support from, like, let's say, central office with that position, like, pretty much, because I almost want to say they're kind of on their own, I guess. They receive support from the ERFC staff. Okay, so there's a gotcha. training for that. There's a, they meet regularly uh, as updates are, are given. So th they provide that training from the ERFC staff. All right, thank you. And then another question I have is, so personally, I understand that it might not be feasible to have a completely covered second AT position, but something that I was thinking about, because with my own personal experiences with my school's AT, you know, her office doesn't open till like 2 or one thirty because she doesn't teach any classes at my school, and most athletics are after school. And then it had me thinking, okay, if we have that second position full-time, that full-time would pretty much be from the afternoon to late in the evening. So it's almost as if it's a second job, if that makes any sense. Like maybe they might have a day job and this might be their other job. So maybe would it be a good idea to think about increasing the pay because at some point maybe we should show that we're actually listening to the people throughout the county who are saying that we need more attention for that second AT position. Maybe a pay increase might be a good incentive to have them stay with us because I, Last night, what I heard was a trend was t uh, other second AT positions leaving rather than staying. So I can say about the AT position, uh, I know that board members, are, we, we all heard the, the same conversation last night. And it was, for me, the first time that I was hearing some of that conversation. And so we haven't had the opportunity to delve into that in these few hours that we've had this morning. Uh, but that is an area that, that we can look at. And as Dr. Uh, Reed said, that not only looking at those secondary stipends for AT positions, but then other stipends uh, that we have uh, stipended positions within the system for those who are doing additional work. Uh, w one thing that we added to the budget uh, this year was the additional dollars to have parity for elementary teachers uh, with middle and high school teachers uh, with, a as it relates to being department chairs and getting a stipend for that. That's something we heard. But uh, again, that conversation last night hadn't heard that at that level and so have some opportunities to look into that. Awesome, and then kind of on that note on stipends or something, I'm not really sure how this position works, but I know at my school we have a tech office, so we have ITs that are, I want to say there are three or four of them that are our tech specialists, so if like a teacher can't get our, um, what is it called, presenters working or like a student's laptop isn't working, you get sent down there, and I know for sure that there are more than two, and it had me thinking, is that a full-time position? If so, how does that position kind of compare to ATs then? Because, you know, we have more than one of those IT specialists when, to, to be completely honest, like, yeah, exactly. So our T-specs are formula-driven uh, in all of our schools. Uh, and as we heard last night, the, the AT position uh, for that secondary stipend, I, again, have to look into it. Not sure if that is necessarily formula-driven, but the T-spec positions are formula-driven. And, and SBITs are formula-driven. So we have 
two folks in the schools who are focused on, on technology, those who are uh, ensuring that the technology is working, and those who are working with teachers to use it uh, as part of instruction. All right, thank you so much. Um, Ms. Tolan, do you want to go? Hi there. A um, couple of questions. I wanted to maybe change the tactic a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk about um, particularly our employees that are paid by the hour. So, for example, um, when you you had a chart on the bus drivers um, showing you know the hourly rate in comparison to other districts. Um, and I, I was remiss in not asking this question maybe during our calendar discussions um, because the number of days that we, you know, are not in school but we're still paying the bus drivers or they're, you know, they're also taking PD or whatever, I think in comparison to other districts is something that we need to look at too for, to compare the overall compensation. So the, the contract length for those individuals? The contract length or I, the days that are off throughout the school year. You know, I think we have to compare the, that amount to other districts as well. Just multiply it you know, by the hourly rate to figure out what their overall compensation is. Yeah, I can, I, we can take a look to see what other contract lengths are for some of these, for, for our um, contracted hourly. Yeah, and then, you know, I guess that's even, is that part of our calendar discussion as well? in, uh, you know, looking at the days that we have for, you know, professional development, you know, work days, days off, how many of those days are actually offered to, for professional development for hourly workers, you know, food and nutrition services, bus drivers, et cetera. So we have that breakdown. I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, for the, based on the number of days that we have in the school year with the 15 uh, professional uh, work days that we have for our uh, teacher level staff uh, based on the individual contract uh, we ensure that if it's not not a, a paid non work day for our bus drivers that they are in receiving professional development but it's really based on the contract length so we can get that information to the board to show how many days uh, the, those individuals are working but again we have two plans for bus drivers, we have the the older plan, the uh, previous plan, which has uh, pay that's balanced out over the course of the year, and then we have a, a, a newer plan where you have a, a certain number of paid non-work days because those employees chose to take a higher salary um, and, and not have their salary stretched over the course of the year. But we can provide that information to the board. Yeah, that would be good, and how it compares to, you know, Loudon and Prince William in particular would be useful. Um, I wanted to go back to um, this whole conversation around the compression, salary compression, and the work that was done years ago to, um, you know, compress the salaries and give people more of an upfront, you know, pay. Um, you know, we had a couple people that made comments last night that, you know, we have put in this budget a step on the end of the scale as a method to retain you know, people that have been, you know, are at that level. Um, but they were saying that it's not, it doesn't really work. So I, I'm interested in the math, I guess, around the idea for the adding the step. You know, how does that really work for employees? And then, you know, just a conversation around that compression work that was done earlier, why it was done, why are we thinking of changing that at this point in time? Um, you know, do we want to talk about it doing an overall, you know, Dr. Wilson, you, you mentioned this the other day to me, looking at a whole um, relook at our com compensation. And that may fit into what some of the other people have brought up as far as, you know, we need to just do a multi year real look at our compensation and where we fit and have a multi-year plan for being where we want to be. What you heard last night, there were two perspectives on that additional step. And so when we talk about it, that it doesn't work, for some employees it really means that it doesn't necessarily work for me. 
And, and so when we try to provide uh, uh, additional compensation, we look at how it might impact employees across the board. The two perspectives last night, one was we, you know, th that additional step, uh, I don't want that because uh, it, it has an impact on my ability toward full retirement. Uh, and then the other was, well, the, the, the value of that additional step doesn't really help me uh, overall with my overall compensation. There are different ways that we can keep up with neighboring jurisdictions. And so as Prince William, and we don't want to highlight schools, but we know that from their scale, they have more steps than we do, and they continue to add steps. One way to keep up is to continue to add steps so that employees um, uh, don't choose to go to a, a neighboring jurisdiction. That's one way. I'm not saying that that is the way, but that is one way. Another way that we can look at ensuring that our scales are higher than our neighboring jurisdictions is to have a higher MSA than they do. Because as, as uh, Ms. Burden said, the, the MSA raises the entire scale and that keeps us competitive in the market. Market scale adjustment raises the entire scale. Steps are something that every jurisdiction is stepping employees. And so whatever the value of that step is, if everyone steps, and we're at number two in the market, and if everyone steps, we're going to continue to be at number two in the market. If you want to improve your market uh, condition, it's ensuring that we ha also have that market scale adjustment. Employees at the top of the scale, if you're at the top of the scale, the only increases that you receive is through market scale adjustment if there's no place for you to go. And so by adding this 1%, it's giving our employees the 3% market scale adjustment as proposed in the budget, and then an additional 1%, depending on, uh, that's the value of those steps at the end, about an additional 1% that you wouldn't have gotten um, if we wouldn't add that additional step at the end. No, I appreciate that explanation. And so I'm just, maybe I need to see a specific example to make, see how the math works. So. so can you repeat your question? I mean, the, the bottom line is, is if we don't add a step at the top, we will remain, you know, at 24 steps compared to Prince William's 30, um, Loudon's 30 and Arlington's 31 steps. Um, and in addition to that, those employees would only receive the MSA. They would not receive a step increase. Um, we've had different strategies uh, in the time that I've been here. You know, sometimes we've given a bonus because you all generally get a lot of um, conversation from employees who are not going to get that step increase because they're at the top. Sometimes we've given them a bonus. Sometimes um, last this in this current year we added a step we want to do that again in fiscal 24 again because we have a short schedule compared to Prince William and Loudon and Marty is absolutely right um, you know 10 years ago Loudon was behind us in salaries and there was a purposeful intentional effort to not give step increases but to give big MSAs because it propels your salary schedule forward and so that you compare more favorably with surrounding divisions. But in Fairfax, you know, step is king. So um, evidenced by the number of comments about steps that were not received. So that might not be a good strategy for us, but it definitely works. So it is 1.05. Um, let, we're five minutes late for our break. Let's take 30 minutes and we'll come back and do go backs and um, go from there.
All right, folks, I think we have enough people here. We've got to get started. Um, okay. I'm going to go ahead down the go back list, and if you don't want to go back, just say no, thank you. Uh, Ms. Karen Keyes, are you ready to begin? Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Ms. Karen Corbett. Um, you know what? I, I think you it's a free for all. It's a budget work session and if you have other things to say, you should feel free to do that. But that's that's my own personal idea. A couple of things and I will be very brief. Our alternative school programs are down by 30% enrollment. Our budget for them is not down by 30% enrollment, and the language in the budget document says we're looking at it, but we don't look at uh, cost savings or trying to be more uh, to optimize our approach to that. So I would like that we uh, look at that in more detail. Okay. Um, that's, that's, that's why it's referenced in the, yeah. in the budget document. That they, they are taking a look at that, that enrollment is down. Um, although I, I believe that the instructional people think that that is going to rebound, but they're not, the, st the staffing and for that program is not governed by staffing standards. So we are taking a look at the enrollment and the level of staffing um, for that currently. It just wasn't in time for. The proposed budget. I appreciate that, but the write-up does not indicate that we're looking at it for efficiencies, but more for um, additional outcomes. And I think we have to look at it for both, because when you're talking about a 30 percent decrease in um, numbers of students, that is significant. Um, similarly, our Young Scholars Program, I have raised this to you. Um, I am concerned. I don't see it explicitly called out in additional allocations. Um, there are others that are called out, so I would like to see us have a very specific and intentional response to our Young Scholars, because we do know um, that that is a nationally recognized program and one that does have a significant impact on outcomes. Um, and because I didn't know I was going to be first up, I will reserve the rest of my time to come back at another point. Okay. Um, Ms. Keys Gamara? Yes. Um, I, I want to start with uh, ERFC because I, I hear the conversation and I understand the need to identify the benefit and make sure that all of our uh, potential staff members understand that benefit. I think probably part of the problem may be is that there are perspectives that we may not be accounting for. There may be some people who don't, they just don't want to think in a long range way and we have to take that into account. And if we're considering um, making it an option, then I am going to need to know what impact that might have on that program um, and in and I think employees would want that, a heads up on that as well. So um, I, I'm, I'm all for exploring. Uh, I just want to make sure we're asking all of those questions. Um, with respect to since some of the wishes that I have in terms of making sure that we identify uh, the rationale um, for our budgets and, and what decisions we are making, I have no doubt that these conversations are taking place. Um, but I'm not, I do have some doubt as to whether others outside of uh, these discussions here uh, internally understand those reasonings. Um, and so for that um, reason, I'd like to see if we can get um, more specific information about our STEM programs. I was concerned when I heard last night that um, there are some schools that may be considering discontinuing those programs. If I don't know if that is true, Dr. Reed, uh, we always hear information that we have to do a fact check on. Um, but if that is the case, um, then certainly that's something we want to talk about. I'll take a pause. I, it looks like you're reaching for your light. Yeah, the, um, the the issue about STEM that was spoken about last night, um, we, we've already researched that, and that particular school um, was choosing to take one of their resource teachers and make that a halftime position for the STEM program, but their enrollment pre-COVID to current is 150 students down, 
So they received less resource classroom teachers because of that loss of enrollment and have opted to not or don't believe they're going to be able to fund that half-time STEM teacher as a result of their enrollment loss and how they were funding it before. I, I do understand those details, but if we as a system identify STEM education all the way through from elementary school through high school, then that perhaps changes how those decisions should be addressed. If it is a board priority for us, as we have discussed, to make sure that all students have uh, access to advanced math, have access to uh, the science levels that allows them to, to participate at the higher levels of, of thinking when they get to high school, then that's the kind of rationale that I'm talking about and hope that we can identify going forward. Thank you. Ms. Cohen followed by Mr. Frisch. Well, and then also maybe lobby the state to try to get it. Like, if we're going to identify, we haven't changed the triple T formula in a million years of what are the things that your child must access. Um, you know, maybe I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I, I promise you it's not just that one school. I'm not going to call any of my schools out today, but privately I would be happy to share um, my schools who made that same. And some of them, to be honest, made it because they needed to put money into the reading specialist to support our change of literacy, which, again, I wholeheartedly agree with. So it's not like they're utilizing it in a wasteful way, but to Ms. Keys Gamara's point, we keep emphasizing STEM, 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 and we see all of this, then we got to be talking the walk or walking the walk if we're talking the talk. So I agree with that. Um, do we still only recognize um, up to step 14 if somebody's transferring here as a teacher? It's, it's interesting. We're having a conversation about actually have a meeting scheduled this week to, to talk about uh, what the impact might be if we would accept more years of service. We know that neighboring jurisdictions have adjusted some of theirs. Uh, Prince William has gone up to 20 years of service. Um, the, everyone else is generally in that 13 to 15 years of service, but we're having a conversation about that. And then would the, um, our um, retirement program that you were looking at, would it be similar to Prince William, that ROP, the Retirement Opportunity Program that they have for retirees? So I'm not sure about the retirement opportunity for for um, retirees that they have. And, and coming from me at the table here, I'm not making the recommendation that we change the ERFC program. That's a conversation for the board. Um, not not um, ERFC, the return to work for retirees. Oh, the return to work. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I've got ERFC on the brain. So. Um, uh, we can take a look at that. I, I'm not familiar with the program, and we can uh, ask uh, Dr. Wilson to work with uh, the HR uh, lead there. I'm familiar with um, the program and the benefits uh, specifically to teachers, um, also bus drivers. So um, we're very familiar. It's a matter of marketing. And so as you noticed on this one of the slides, that that is one of our um, strategies. And so uh, that will be included in our marketing strategy. I think that's awesome. I'm really excited that you guys are looking at that. Um, you know, one thing I would say, I guess my frustration around the trainers piece, and I, I do want to just take a second to say how outstanding our students, every time we have something like this happen, even if they're upset about something, the amount of pride, this is my, I shared uh, with the folks next to me last night that this is my second kiddo that I got to teach in preschool who's come to testify in front of the school board while I've been here. And Man, my heart was just bursting out um, of my chest, so proud um, of those kids. But I, I do, we've had this conversation as a board about what, I guess, opportunity cost is the best thing, but, but what are we not funding? Because we don't ever see that. And so when I reached back out about the athletic trainers, I found out that it had been an internal budget ask in 2020, 2023, and now 2024. So I guess part of my worry is if we say like, you know, we don't see this as a necessity, but, but somebody who knows more collectively than the board does about what's happening on the field, on the ground, at, has identified it as an issue. Um, how does it rise? This is the first we're hearing about it as a board. So again, it just speaks to that loss of connection that we've talked about of what doesn't get funded. So I know I'm over time, but I just wanted to raise that issue. Let's see. Anybody want to 
So I would would say that there are a variety of requests that come forward uh, from departments through assistant superintendents and chiefs uh, annually. And when we look at that, uh, th that set of requests, there are items that we look at to possibly table for upcoming years. It's really about looking at the uh, priorities that we have before us, looking at the revenue stream that we foresee uh, before us, and, and working to uh, work with the superintendent to present uh, a budget that meets those priority needs and also take a look at and adhere to directives from uh, the legislature. So when you look at the 5% increase, we want to ensure that we follow through with that. When we have the 1% uh, bonus, we those are things that we shall do. So when you carve out that much money uh, and then when you see what's left over, we then have to prioritize. And uh, the items that were brought forth were those items that were prioritized. And yes, there are then things that uh, that that fall off uh, and you know, we would love to be able to do everything we know that we have principals who have uh, all of our principal associations work together to pr provide uh, requests as part of the budget process our teacher associations did that that same thing uh, and we've had to go back then and have conversations about why certain things were added and why certain things weren't but uh, dr. Reed has said it that it's uh, it's dollars in dollars out and it's either um, and Dr. Reed, you said it so well about more pay, fewer people, fewer people, more pay, but, but. okay, there we go. Uh, those are the things we consider as part of the budget process. Chris? Thank you. Um, I've submitted a budget uh, question during our break um, that I put out there now. I'm specifically asking for slides three and four to be recalculated with the cost of living um, taken into consideration uh, because I'm interested to know where we would fall um, on the value of those dollars if we considered the cost to live in the community. Um, I think uh, as, as strong as we are, we would probably fall down a little bit. Um, and, you know, as evidenced by the, you know, nearly a third of our staff who live in other jurisdictions uh, and, and work for us um, to make their dollars go further. Um, have we ever uh, looked at the cost of living related to this data? And if so, what can you tell us about it just from top of mind? No, I mean, it's, it's just based on the salary schedules that are adopted by the um, surrounding divisions is the data that's presented here. Um, we we do do some cost of living looks at stuff, but we haven't done it in any kind of holistic formal way, way for yeah, or formal okay. way with um, all the divisions. I, I can say that when we benchmark for salary studies, we do uh, uh, in some positions take into account cost of living, so that we're doing apples to apples comparisons and then do an adjustment based on that cost of living to, to take that out so that you could see what that benchmarking would look like. Right. Okay. I'll be interested to see that data come back in the budget questions. I appreciate it. Um, one thing, I, on, on the subject of ERFC, um, I want to be clear that I don't think anybody on our board wants to jeopardize the solvency of okay. our retirement programs um, and certainly would never advocate for anything that would jeopardize the solvency. I think... Um, what we want is we're all trying to come up with different ways to retain people and get people here and looking for different ways of understanding what we're offering is how is that a benefit to entice people here. And so um, looking at the, uh, the chart on, I believe it's page, which is it page four that has the benefits included, no. Sorry, it, yeah, yeah, it's page four, page four um, where we are basically tied for second, uh, separated by a couple hundred bucks. Um, I think it's important that that um, our efforts around retention and recruitment stress why we are here in this position and that we lead with this information as opposed to the dollars in pocket. But we can't discount what it means to have dollars in pocket. Um, and so uh, another budget question that I submitted, um, which I spoke to Dr. Wilson about, um, relates to, my time is up, that was quick. 
Okay. Well, just to, to speak to, thank you for the sort of entree, and I don't know what the rest of your question is. I thought you were going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> the mighty Karnak. Let's yeah, see. Right. Uh, so I did provide some information uh, around the table uh, uh, th with some documentation and pamphlets that, w that ERFC provides our employees regarding the Tier 1, Tier 2, and legacy plans. Uh, very quick explainers to talk about the benefits. And interestingly enough, when I went upstairs for lunch, uh, one of my colleagues uh, received an email in her uh, email inbox today. ERFC has been working to develop uh, an explainer of benefits. Uh, and we've posted that on my PDE. Uh, at some point, it will be uh, something that we ask all employees to, to watch, but in this year of mandatory trainings, we've decided not to do that. Uh, but it's a very good explainer of what ERFC is in three minutes and what that benefit is to you. And that's been pushed out to all uh, employees who are eligible for ERFC. That went out today. So it was fortuitous as part of the conversation that uh, that information is being shared. Uh, so those who are watching and then got the email might think, um, <laughs> wow, we were having that conversation. Uh, but I did want to explain that and uh, also want to ensure the board that we are committed to working with the RFC and can uh, certainly ask uh, Eli Martinez to answer any questions that the board might have prior to the budget pro process coming to a culmination about ERFC, and he'd be happy to do that. Dr. Anderson followed by Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. When I get through all four of my things, on slide six, you're talking about the um, bus driver market comparison. I think similarly to Ms. Um, Tolan, I would be interested in the number of work days, the number of unpaid days during the year. Pretty much I'd like to get a sense of the earning potential for the year to get that comparison across the divisions. Similarly, for slide seven, which speaks about the family liaisons, this again has the hourly rate, and I think this um, impacts a small subgroup of our parent liaisons. We've had a lot of conversation, and I know there, there's some data still yet to be provided to us in terms of how many um, parent uh, family liaisons are not um, contracted with benefits and how many are, whether it's their choice or not. I think that information will be very helpful I would also like to ask a question. This is from the document we had last week, and that may be included in the things you sent to us this morning, Ms. Burden, but I did not get a chance to peruse it. The high school counselor extended contract, this is .2 million, where the counselor day will run from 204 to 219. Can you speak a little bit in terms of what the expectations are of those additional work days? particularly since students are not there. High volume. Yeah, our understanding is it was to help with um, master schedules and work in the summer that falls upon them. And I'll just read verbatim, the counselors will provide additional support to the director of student services in managing the high volume of work that must be completed in the summer before students return to school. Uh, high schools receive an average nine counselors each, and with our smallest school receiving seven counselors and the largest school receiving 11. I appreciate that, but I'd like to get a better sense. Of, I mean, obviously, the volume of work is um, high for everyone, but why is this one more crucial than maybe something else? So I'd like some additional information, but I'll come back to that. The other piece that I will be sending some questions about just to give you a little bit of a preview is regarding FLESS. I know this is something that has come and gone, um, but I believe that at this point we have 55 schools that have FLESS, 17 with, do, um, with immersion programs, so that leaves about 100 odd schools without any programming. What is our thinking here? Um, I don't know, is Dr. Presidio here? I saw him earlier. Is he on? Gosh. He was here. Well, Dr. Reed, then it's your question. <laughs> the foreign language in the elementary schools, and so we can get an answer for you, but I know that uh, Dr. Presidio uh, would be able to, to write all those numbers off uh, very easily. But Sure, and I have a report that gives me the numbers. What I'm looking for is some intent. What is our plan where we have some of our schools have it, some don't? 
what is what what are we wanting to communicate regarding language at the elementary level, and what is it that we're doing, and how do we close that gap between intent and actual practice? So <clears throat> I think what we are communicating is that we have inequitable experiences for elementary students with regard to learning a second language, period, right? So if we want to make that equitable and provide language at every school, uh, we need a commitment to do that and a budget resource allocation to do that. I, I kind of wonder, <clears throat> I don't kind of, I wonder if a second language might be a space that connects to elementary planning time as well. Because one of the things, you know, that our elementary principals and staff for years have done is they've traded that general ed planning time for time with specialists. Um, again, though, that's a commitment that's pretty significant. So I don't know. We have a number of certificated staff assigned to schools that are not in classrooms. And we may need to look at what are we currently doing with those assignments if we say that a second language is critical, then maybe that's more important than a different reason we have a staff member assigned to a building. So much to unpack here, but it makes me wonder about the 55 sites that currently have FLES. Do those sites addi have additional planning time that the other elementary schools do not? Uh, that's a great question, Marty. So they do not have additional. When we created the formula initially uh, and provided the 300 minutes of planning time for our teachers, those schools that had FLES, uh, we used that FLES staffing uh, as part of their allocation so that they could create that time. So that they don't have additional time, but we have used that FLES staffing so that they can meet that uh, 300 minutes of planning time for their teachers. That, that was part of the overall calculation initially. So I will be sending a budget question, but I would like to have a conversation in terms of the division's purpose and commitment or to what is it that we're going to do with elementary language. So Marty, I want to make sure I understand what you just said. <clears throat> you said they don't get extra staff, but they're able to meet the 300 minutes of planning time. So they receive additional staffing for FLES. And when we were when we created the formula so that our schools could use their triple T time to cover uh, uh, the 300 minutes of planning time for teachers, we included that FLES staffing as part of the individual school's overall staffing to meet the 300 minutes. So I would infer from that that our 55 schools that have a second language, the teachers in those schools get their elementary planning time. I would say that, all, that the calculation is that all of our teachers get their, their planning time. We just, we just added the FLES staffing as part of that overall calculation. So we didn't give the FLES staffing as an add-on. Mm -hmm. So other schools have just triple T staffing to create that 300 minutes. Schools with FLES have the triple T time and FLES to provide that 300 minutes for their teachers. Thank you. Just to, to be very clear, so, and sorry, Marty was saying it correctly, but I have another way to say it that I think might help. We have a differentiated formula whereby FLES schools get an amount of triple T based on a higher divisor, and non-FLES schools have a lower divisor, and so they get more triple T than a FLES school. Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, I want to revisit again, Dr. Reed, that everything we do is going to impact retention as well as recruitment in this work related to the salary scales and uh, total compensation annually, total career earnings. And, um, you know, I want to just draw attention again to slide four um, because so much discussion was about retention, we're not going to benefit and put our best foot forward. And in fact, I think it's a, a self-inflicted wound that if you look at slide four, this should be done by rank order, not alphabetical. Because the brain, for most people, first thing they're going to see and what's going to imprint on their mind is where they're going to see the different schools and understand things. So the rank is... It, instead, it was just done alphabetical. And that was on the prior slides as well. Um, and so, I, you know, in fact, what was really difficult was on slide three, they did all the divisions we compared against, and then FCPS was down at the bottom, which, again, I, I, I don't think that's helpful because it requires 
whether it's a board member or a member of the public, to now have to, on especially slide three, start self, you know, doing the ranking yourselves. Yeah. And, and, then, and then because we're doing stovepipe proposals, as opposed to a holistic analysis, we have board members who are even confused about the fact that when you take the 6.4% annually, that we are paying to our employees, it's just going directly into ERFC versus into their paycheck. We're number one. So anytime I hear a board member say, or a member of the public, that we're not competitive, it's because of how we're presenting this information. And I don't know how we combat against ourself in the self-inflicted wound. And there goes two minutes, so I will want to go back because I think we still have a decent amount of time. Yep, we have an we'll hour see. and a half. Um. Before, before they, you move on to the next person, I mean, Dr. Reed, do you have any thoughts on this? Not just for me, but for board members of the public listening, how can we do this better? Well, <clears throat> I think the career earnings, maybe there needs to be another column that's the ERFC column, but, but it would only be for us, right, Fairfax? Um, although, if it's significant, I don't know, it's step 20 or step 30, how many 4,000s would we have gone through-ish? Would it be 30 times 4,000? So adding that, what does that do to us? I mean, like if it puts us at the top, then wouldn't we want to... Um, you know, like maybe have a with ERFC additive asterisk, this is what the career earnings would be. Yeah, we can do that. Um, we can, you know, include a note on this. Um, and if you added the 120,000, we would still fall below Prince William. Mm -hmm. Okay, number two. 120 plus 2702 is still less than 2834. That, that's why we need the actual numbers in the calculation, because I didn't get 120,000 extra. So it'd be good to see staff's calculations on that 6.4 over the course of a career. OK. It, it's about 4,000 times 30 years. 4,000 times 30 years is $120,000. Yeah, this is. <laughs> I think okay. point is taken. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser followed by Ms. Omesh. Thank you. Um, I wanted to pivot to one of the topics I had up earlier and to Ms. Um, Cullen's point of things that internally are asked for for many years, but maybe it doesn't rise to our level, although it has come, I think, to several of us in terms of performing arts stipends. And it's something I've been hearing about for over a year from our performing arts staff. And especially critical now that Loudoun has significantly changed its performing arts stipend. So just as a comparison between, um, and I can send you this, but between what we are doing for a band director at the high school level is about 4475 and Loudoun's is 12000 just as one example, assistant band director, we're 3241, Loudon is 3357. When you look at theater, um, they're giving a stipend just for the admin cost of producing, not just physical directing, of 6919. And then directing, there's multiple categories of director, 6250, 1500 for the technical director, I could go on. We give one year stipend of 4748. Um, and I'm happy to provide the comparisons to our athletic coaches as well. But this is for multiple months. That's for three productions a year, multiple months of rehearsals and shows, and does not include a tri the trips, competitions. So I'm very worried about our, our performing arts stipends. And again, I know this is something that's risen internally, so I wanted to kind of flag that as I know we didn't hear about that as much as the athletic trainer stipends, but um, given what Loudon is doing and given um, we're going to, I think we're going to lose some of our really good staff. So I just wanted to bring this up as an issue, and I'm happy to send on some of this data. I put in a budget question, but this is just something that staff has brought to several of us over the last year. So I just wanted to flag that. Um, as we're looking at stipends and we're looking at equity between arts and sports, which I know you guys have heard me mention since the pandemic hit about equity between arts and athletics, we need to look at how we're stipending our folks who are um, spending many, many hours in the evenings working and putting on performances. So um, having said that, I will. I see I have six seconds left, so I'll just pause and see if anyone wants to comment on stipends and where that's looking in our budget. So I'm... Um 
absolutely committed to having competitive stipends for our fine and performing arts and our coaches. Um, I think the work staff does outside the classroom often is as valuable as the work they do inside the classroom, right? It's teaching across the board. So we'll take a look at that. Um, I think I've gotten an email from, is it Tara? Yeah, so um, with the comparative. So we'll take a look at that. Yeah, and with my two seconds, I just want to talk about when we talk about belonging and connection and portrait of graduate skills, performing arts and fine performing arts is one of the best places for students to find that place. So I'll stop. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so I, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm happy to follow only to say, I mean, first of all, it's, it's good that this is being elevated, the performing arts piece, but once again, you know, here's a performing arts thing. We heard about athletic directors. I, I just continue to, I guess, have frustration about how we do this and how we choose what's a priority and how we assess needs to begin with before we start a budget process. So I said this every year, but um, mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, in our strategic planning, we can figure something out. But we've got to develop some kind of needs assessment process before the budget process as a part of the cycle. Uh, and then a prioritization process that we agree on that uh, ensures fair outcomes. Um, but with that, I actually want to go back to the steps, a conversation that was way earlier in the beginning of this. Uh, Ms. Burden, I remember seeing that in our last work session, there was a 36.4 million number saved because of just staffing. Uh, I guess my, my question there is, is it beyond what we predicted in terms of how much we would save on like retirements and things like that? Yeah, you're talking about base savings, which yeah. is lapse in turnover. So what is your question? How, how uh, much does that number deviate from like the average of what we had seen in years before? Um, it's, a, it's a little higher in the fiscal 24 budget than it has been historically um, because we have greater vacancies than, mm -hmm. than we've had um, previously. But in the wavy guide that we included on the board um, item today, um, in the back of the uh, document is the lapse in turnover um, assumptions that the divisions around us make. What negative number do they throw into their mm -hmm. budget to account for that? And they usually range from 1% to 2% of your salary, of your annual salary. Although people may be running a little high like we are for the current year um, just because, you know, there are vacancies everywhere in public education. Right, yeah, no, I, and I figured it was higher than our prediction, I guess, is right, and what it's reflecting, yeah. I point that out because this is, again, another indicator, red flag, whatever, uh, of where we're bleeding for us to reflect, um, and which brings me to the steps piece. I really would, and if this is a follow-on, I know Mr. Frisch mentioned it, um, it's been something I've been considering as a follow-on, then so be it, but in thinking about how we can do right by our employees, I just want to clarify, looking at page seven, I saw you know four gears that steps weren't listed. I believe it may have been five though, right, Ms. Burden? Can you help me remember? Since 2013, there, was four steps missing. there are four steps missing. And okay. that's, that's all the historical we have with us. Yeah, do you know like for, a, for some of our uh, longest serving staff members, how many years they may have missed their steps? And we have people with us that have been serving from yeah, then. Yeah, um, no, I appreciate that. And, and the honesty is um, difficult, but, uh, but it is, right? It's 10, and when our staff have started as teachers, they didn't anticipate that they'd be 10 years behind on increases that they were otherwise planning for. So if we can't do it every year to do right by folks now, I'd like us to at least give some thought, reflection, and analytics around correcting that for retirement. So if they retire, at least they're getting in retirement what that the number of years they've served reflects as opposed to just steps that ended up being cut by 10. The, the steps are not related to retirement. Retirement is just about creditable, creditable compensation. So the state doesn't, VRS doesn't really care what step you're on. It's the total amount of salary 
um, for the three highest years. But the salary reflects how many steps are being counted, right? That, that's the issue. Ms. McLaughlin. That, that's what I want to clarify, right? Because so they could have been 10 steps ahead in what that salary is when they retire. Right, so Oops. even if we can't pay them at that step right now, hey can guys, they when they retire? Let Ms. Somesh speak. Your time's actually up. Can yeah. we have staff Clarify. answer what they think her question is? If not, we'll put you on a go back. I do wonder, Ms. Somesh, while they're grabbing somebody to answer the question maybe more mm -hmm. in more detail, given the compression of the salary schedule, I would question whether there are 10 more steps to put them on before retirement. Mm -hmm. So it, especially if they're a long-term employee, but I will defer to our yeah. budget person. Yeah, so at some point mm -hmm. with those 10 steps, they would have gotten to the top of the scale. And the only way that those individuals would have gotten any additional compensation would have been through market scale adjustment. So it might be hard to sort of uh, figure out where individuals would be. And as we think about all the employees who have missed steps <laughs> since 1999, you'd have to do an individual look at those employees to see where they would have landed, Actually, what increases they received over that time. Um, and then when you look at how ERFC is calculated, or I'm sorry, VRS and ERFC are calculated for retirement, it's based, well, there are different amounts for different employees. And so for different tiers of ERFC, it's based on three or five years of service, uh, and it's your highest uh, years of service. And so if you were to add either a bonus or a lump sum, it would be hard to figure out how we would add that lump sum, but I'm going to let Ms. Holly Brown speak to it because she is our uh, benefits expert. Sorry. <laughs> Marty did a really great job of kind of stepping into the individual income aspect of this. For both VRS and, or the majority of VRS participants who are not in hybrid, and for folks who are in ERFC and FCRS, those are traditional pension programs, and those pension programs are operated on a trust, and the trust is funded based on cost assumptions for providing benefits into the future. And I know that sounds a little bit like gobbledygook, but it's based on earnings. And so what happens is there is a funding requirement to provide benefits into the future. In the hybrid program, there's a component that is deferred compensation, and that's based on investments and earnings on investments that employees make. So that's a portion of the hybrid program for the VRS. Where we, the reason I took the time to, to explain that is that when you have somebody's compensation and they are not stepping, in this case, a number of steps over the course of a, of a um, employment, there's really not a way um, that I'm aware of to make up for step loss because that's over a long period of time. So Marty was correct. Um, the pension programs that we have today um, take into account high five earnings. And so you would have to have an analysis for folks, individual situations, and think about rather large investments towards the end of their career if that was the interest of the board. And, and to add to that, the, the reason why our, the county's portion or the school's portion for employees is 6.44% is because actuarially that's been mapped out based on our current earnings and where we think individuals might go. And so if we were to make those steps up, then our actuarial calculations would be redone, and then the employer contribution, we would see an increase in the employer contribution in addition to the dollars that we made up with STEP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know that's my time, but I'll follow up after. Thank you, Ms. Somesh. Um, Ms. Marin, followed by Mr. Nakofa. Okay, Mr. Nakofa. Hi, um, thank you for this. Uh, you know, just listening to the comments and hearing what Dee, you were just saying, I think it's, it really, we really have to do some soul searching and this can't be something we do even think about this year. Um, but we have to talk about this pension plan. And if we feel like young people want to invest in another way or it's not a 
a big bonus for us in re recruitment or retention. That is going to anger a lot of people who came here, who were there. I, I don't even know how that works. If you, but there has to be a complete, full, and total analysis as to what this would look like if we were to restructure this in such a major way. So, so I, go ahead, Marty. Mr. Arnett Kopex, you remember when we added the tier two and it, the many school board meetings that we had <laughs> uh, with uh, our consultant, the ERFC consultant, Aon, uh, sitting through multiple board discussions about the impact of, of some of those decisions. So. Uh, if the board were to go in that direction, uh, the ERFC would engage in that work to provide uh, that update. The Fairfax County or staff and ERFC would provide uh, detailed information around the impacts of, of those changes. Well, 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 thank you for that, Mr. Smith. But I, that was different. That was more so the pension could sustain itself and we still had the tier one, I forget what they're called, but we still had the legacy plan, right? The legacy plan. Yep. And yes, here we go. And the legacy plan and the tier one and the tier two. And there was a lot of consternation about leaving everyone without the legacy plan. So yep. I think we have to think long and hard about how we do that. And um, if it's, this, and I think if it continues to be a want, that then that does have to be identified, as um, some of my colleagues have said, as a portion of compensation for our employees when we're looking across the board. I think that, that that's necessary. Well, we currently have about 3,000 employees in the legacy plan, and so as we see attrition, we'll see fewer employees being eligible for retirement at 55. Currently, employees in the Tier 2 plan, uh, your retirement, you're eligible at 67 uh, when Social Security age kicks in. So um, we do have employees who are eligible today for retirement at 55. But again, as those employees retire, uh, we will see a change to that uh, for our Tier 2 and Tier 3. 67 for both, I forget. For Tier 2, it's 67. For, um, and for Tier 1, it's a combination of age and service. Age years, and service. Years, nine, uh, years nine, of service yeah. and age. Okay. 60 plus 30. 60 plus 30, 90, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, my last comment is about, and Dr. Reed, you and I have talked about this a lot. We've talked about some of the inequities that exist on all levels, and you've walked into this. Um, this isn't something that you can solve overnight, and this is something that strategic plan, Ms. Somesh, you talked about this, the strategic plan will help us prioritize these. But we, we around the table, we've mentioned performing arts, STEM, language programs, where are they? Um, I've spoken to you about, uh, you know, sports where equipment itself is not funded at all. You know, cross country, you buy, you buy your it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars to participate in cross country because nothing is given to us at the school level, whereas opposed to some of the larger sports um, or more revenue drawing sports have their entire equipment given to them. So. Those inequities have to be looked at and they have to be prioritized. Um, I'm saying what some of my colleagues have said. And I think as we, as you go into this next year, while you are navigating through this budget process, may I respectfully say that perhaps what you should be doing is gathering with staff some of these things which are not equal across the board. Or our, and, and when we develop our priorities for the for the strategic plan as well as for budgeting, these will all co come to the surface because there's lots of them. I think, uh, Ms. Dernat Kovacs, the what I'm also keenly aware of is that a lot of those inequities sit underneath the new ask. In other words, yes. what we often talk about is this additive ask year over year for the county transfer. And I think a lot of the inequities sit in this larger budget underneath. So they, I think over the do. course of the next yeah. year, sitting down and thinking about not what new monies are required to resolve these inequities, but how do we repurpose monies that are already you right. know, budgeted? Because the ask is always for employees. Right. And, and we want to maintain, like you said, MSAs and steps. And I'm sorry I'm over, but I didn't get my first turn. I know. So I'm, that's, so why, that's you why you're go. letting me go. go. All right. So thank you. And, I, and I'm glad you truly recognize that. So thank you. Um, 
to add, and we're already taking a look, and I've had some conversations with Ms. Neal, who's uh, headed up a lot of our uh, strategic planning work, and looking at some of the formatting uh, that other uh, strategic plans uh, that, that were uh, from North Shore and other school systems that have gone through the same processes that we have. Uh, and their final process is uh, built on sort of this circle that comes out from the center and you have pillars at the center that go all the way out to strategies. And as we think about what that budgeting process looks like, ensuring that it's attached to those strategies that we have around the outer circle will be important for us. Go on. I was just gonna follow up on um, one thing I brought up in my previous turn, and I apologize, I had to step out a bit if this was brought up again. Um, but as part of this sort of overall view and strategic look, if we could, we just talk a little bit more about the idea of, if we really wanna look at compensation across the board, like what that would take and what we need to do. And so I'll let Dr. Wilson talk a little bit about compensation. She's familiar with doing compensation studies and her work in other school systems, uh, but it would uh, involve us uh, identifying uh, a consultant who could work us through a process to do benchmarking across other divisions, thinking about cost of living and some of the other things we've talked about, and taking a full look at our scales. But Dr. Wilson? Thank you. Um, this board could be um, as large or as narrow as we want it to be. Um, it can be as large as looking at salaries and our competitiveness um, across the market. Um, also, um, it can be as narrow um, enough uh, to look at the stipends that we currently have and looking at um, how those look in terms of competitiveness um, with other districts. Um, either of our size or just in the area, however we would like to have that work done. Um, but it is a, a very extensive process. Um, I think the last one that was done here in Fairfax was uh, 2015. And so um, the standard is um, the market, of course, changes very quickly. And so as a standard, um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, organizations look at this work being done every three years. Um, our office does do um, some type of work with benchmarking and looking at other um, districts to determine how competitive we are. But in terms of looking at our um, scales, uh, because that, that is also included in this work as well, um, they can make proposals, um, a vendor can make proposals or recommendations based on um, what they feel uh, needs to happen so that there's equity and pay across the board internally. It's time intensive work for staff, it's time intensive work for the board. There are um, many presentations to the board about the work that uh, the consultant would bring forward that staff undertakes, uh, but it, uh, it is a comprehensive look, and again, we would go out to RFP, we would identify a company who could provide that compensation study for us. Uh, we would look at the parameters uh, and get feedback on what we think those parameters should be, and then uh, work with the board during the course of the year to uh, help the board make a decision about where they want to fall. Thank you, and I, so Dr. Reed, I guess that's something I would defer to you, and you know, I know you have some experts in looking at HR in general, yes. um, so maybe just bringing that information forward to the board and what, you, what reviews you think are necessary or not necessary. Right. Okay, I'll take a turn, because I didn't, um, I was just listening to everything. Um, you know, I think I agree. I mean, we are in a different time and place right now. Um, and, uh, you know, post COVID and even before COVID, right? This, this with um, staff and 
um, you know, finding folks, good folks, uh, for our classrooms have has been kind of slowly happening through the years. So one of my questions is, have we looked at incentive structures to maybe tap into those teachers that are just really excellent teachers who may be in our gen ed classrooms and say, hey, well, how about if we had this bonus or that bonus, would you consider maybe going into our high needs or getting certified to teach special ed? Um, um, our office has done some work um, to encourage um, employees to go into other areas, and so we've provided some workshops and things of that nature to give information on how an employee might um, perhaps become dually certified okay. um, so that perhaps they might be more marketable and go into some other areas. Um, and I, I know where you're going yeah. with that. Um, <laughs> in terms of uh, those who are within the, um, the district who may not be teachers, um, may aspire to be, then you know we also provide um, workshops. I think we have some plan for the spring to um, assist those in, um, who are interested in going to, into the profession um, from other uh, careers. Um, they would have information on what they would need to do to get to that point. And then, of course, we would do what we needed to do to, do to support them and get them to um, where they want to be. So I'm asking us to actually just dig a little deeper than that because I think it's different than just having workshops that are available. That's different than your administrators and other teachers identifying, you know what, this is a master teacher. This is exactly the kind of person we need to put into these high needs spaces in the Title Ones, in special ed, in ESOL, and making it lucrative for them to take that path instead of maybe going on to get an admin license, say, and just leave the, the classroom completely. We have got to, I believe, and I'm not an HR expert, but I, I think, you know, that type of approach will be much more impactful than just saying, oh, if you're interested, come. There's just something different about that. So I want to put um, that out. We've got to start doing that, especially if we are bringing people in who just have a bachelor's degree. And my worry is, and I'm sure you have the background, the, the data, which I'd love to see, where do we see the highest concentration of these folks? Is it in our Title Ones? Is it in our special education? Is it in our ESOL? My guess would probably be yes, because those are critical um, areas of need. So we, I just, for me, this isn't enough. I think we need to do more, and I'm very worried about that because, you know, the trajectory of putting in people into these uh, spaces where kids have the greatest needs that are not the best of the best, I mean, that just means for us year after year more funding needed to make up the gap. Forget about what it does, you know, to kids. So, you know, I know Dr. Anderson started that. I am very worried about that as well, and I would like to see where these folks are. But at the same time, we've got to build people up. You know, and I didn't take my time, so I'm going to maybe go over a little bit um, as well. But we also talked about sinking more funds into Teachers for Tomorrow. We've got very diverse you know, school, uh, uh, student body here. So what are we doing to expand that and make it lucrative for these kids to want this career? We know we are educating these children, uh, you know, on a different level than many across the nation. So we would love to have them back. I know we all agree with, but again, another place where I think we need to be focusing. Um, in regards to the conversations around the you know, the slides, the compensation versus ERFC. I mean, the way I look at it, right or wrong, and I think of myself when I was 21 and what I did and the choices I made then and, you know, when I left uh, FCPS at that time, um, I don't know that saying to people, here is your total compensation package, I think that is important for us. I think that is a conversation for us to have. But to, to somehow think that that will move people um, at the beginning of their careers or, or throughout, honestly, I just don't think that it does. I, I just disagree with you on that. So I, I you know, uh, yeah, okay. 
Well, I, it's not a, so what I'm saying is it's not a topic of education, period. I do not believe it is. I do not believe that will work. Um, so I see ERFC as a retention strategy, as a bonus strategy, but we cannot, I believe, um, it cannot be an either or. I, I, I mean, I think it, we have to look at compensation head on. We may not be the first, we may not be the second, but you cannot bring in ERFC and say, well, look at the total package. I just don't think that sells to people. Maybe I'm wrong, but that is what I believe and um, wanted to share. And we have time for triple backs. Um, so we'll start with <laughs> Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yeah, sorry. I, I just wanted to follow up on the, the For Tomorrow program. So the Teach for Tomorrow, we have Trades for Tomorrow. Uh, some things that you've made me think about is that as we provide uh, we, we do give contracts to our Teach for Tomorrow teachers when they've gone through the program and can show that they have successfully uh, completed a college program, that they have a contract with us. But you've made me think about the possibility of adding a signing bonus with that contract for our Teach for Tomorrow. And then also possibly think about using uh, one-time funds to provide uh, some kind of signing for our own students who come back to work for us for our trades for tomorrow program yeah. as well so I like that. that that's the kind of stuff I'm thinking about that's something to think about and then uh, again we are having that conversation uh, with our uh, title one office uh, along with finance and HR to look at how we might provide differentiated compensation for individuals Good. who work in title one schools because it is a different kind of work okay thank you uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders. And I'll be very brief. Uh, first, regarding the alignment of the budget with our strategic priorities, many of you will remember that that is an initiative, that is a direction that this board gave to, um, to the staff and the previous superintendent, that there was that expectation. And I see that we, over time, have, be, have done that more and more but I would urge that this is a priority because our budget reflects our values. And if we just pay lip service to the values and then look at the budget and see a disconnect, that's a problem. Uh, in one area in particular, we've expanded our um, footprint over the past several years and with all of our renovations and modifications, but I note that we have not kept up to date with our staffing for our tradespeople. Uh, is, I think we've only added two additional tradespeople uh, to the budget. And so I'd like to better understand, is that because we can't find them or because we're using funds elsewhere? So, so are you talking? You can come back to me. We'll, we'll come back I'll to you. I'll send we'll you um, we'll, we'll, we'll the come, reference. We'll come back to you on that. Okay. And, and, and I will say that you were um, uh, the, one of the architects of helping us uh, figure out how we do that better alignment with the budget process. And again, with some of the models that I've seen, being able to tie the budget to that strategy ring of, of what actually happens to get to that work can see it uh, specifically for instruction and those student outcomes, and then to see how that also supports what happens within the CIP and other budgets that support, other areas of the budget that support the overall work and the overall strategic plan, so. Well, I would just suggest that when you go line by line uh, through the budget, you'll see certain areas that have had uh, decreases in funding and other areas that have had increases in funding. And it's not quite clear how those decisions were made based on the priorities that have been espoused by this board and others. And so I think it's really important that you know our budget tells our story well. And I think you guys do a great job of preparing a budget, but we only look every year at the increases to the budget versus having a reflective approach that says, what are the things that um, staff have looked at and said, no, we don't need to do those anymore, or um, you know, we need to do more of this to get where we're at. Mm -hmm. And a good example is the alternative schools where the language doesn't reflect that we're planning on cutting back. 
Thank you. I, <clears throat> if I might, I think the bottom line is that we did have that conversation with department leads and no department lead came back and said they were planning to make any cuts. So I think that um, human nature is that we keep doing what we've done. So we're going to need to take a deeper look starting much sooner this coming year with a new strategic plan about where must we strategically deploy resources if we're going to get different outcomes. Ms. Kizgamara. Followed by Ms. Cohen. That was a perfect segue <laughs> to what I wanted to say because I want to emphasize, um, and, I, and I do think I'm hearing some agreement on how do we communicate the strategy through our budget. If we didn't use words, w would people understand what we're really about, right? Um, and so for that reason, I asked uh, our HR person when we last did our um, uh, surveys, for our employees, because I would like to see those results connected to what concerns we are having in our compensation. I'm assuming that there would be a connection. I think that helps us tell the story, first of all, that we're listening to our employees. We're concerned about how they perceive their ability to be successful in the workplace, and that we're attempting to use uh, whatever resources we have. It may not cost, but in any case, I do think there should be some connection. So I'd like to ask um, that we take the time to do that. And I think you said that the last time was um, November of 22, correct? So we have some very recent surveys um, to look at. Am I correct? Yes, that was our engagement survey. Okay, okay. So if, if I mean, it, it seems to me that, that that makes sense. I also wanted to echo what Ms. Corbett Sanders said with respect to alternative schools. We spent a lot of years, at least my time on the board, and also with this board, uh, talking about the need for more restorative justice as opposed to uh, punishment for our students, giving people an opportunity to, to learn and to grow. And as a result, I think the numbers in our alternative schools um, have gone down. What can that mean? How can we reimagine that opportunity? Um, we've heard our student talk a little bit about, you know, well, can these things be available online? They're not available in my school. So I'd like to see if we're having new investments, I'd like to have it result in new opportunities for our students. Um, my, Ms. Marin mentioned um, identifying 504 funds with the special education um, identification within the budget. I think that's actually a more accurate w way of conveying the story of our investment. Uh, as for as long as I have worked with uh, children in Northern Virginia, Fairfax County Public Schools has been known in providing uh, excellent special education services, but perhaps it will be helpful to include, I think, a more accurate way of identifying how we are investing uh, by including that in the numbers um, in our budget. And I think I had, oh, and then the last thing had to do with what I mentioned a little bit earlier, and that is, and I can have further conversation with you, Dr. Reed, is I know we've identified uh, you know, the science of reading. That is ongoing work. Certainly we need to monitor that. But we've also had extensive conversations about making sure that advanced math opportunities are available at the elementary level, um, as well as improving our science. What does that look like? And I do think all of this would have to be a more a long-range plan as opposed to just this year. So I'm hoping that all of this conversation comes into something that we're building upon per year, and we are actually asking our staff members to step into agreement with what that strategic plan is. Ms. Cohen? Yeah, thank you for that. I think, you know, one question that we, some of us have mentioned about Teachers for Tomorrow as an incentive is helping pay for college. I mean, the contract's great, except not to be a jerk, but every place in the world is looking for teachers right now. So the incentive that used to be, hey, you're going to have a guaranteed job, guess what? You walk out of any school right now with a teaching degree and, pa and can pass a practice exam, you can get hired wherever you want to right now. So, but at the, on the, other side of that is a family like ours is paying for the VCU, the cheapest school, public school in the, in the Commonwealth, 
$31,000 a year for, so my kid's gonna walk out with $120,000 worth of debt to start a job that pays $50,000. So maybe help pay for some schooling um, as scholarships instead of signing bonuses, like maybe help pay. And you have to pay it back if you don't come back here and teach. I mean, we have um, models certainly in our, you know, in our system to look at what it looks like to come back and pay some service. Um, you know, and again, you know, I think when we talk about apples to apples, and I, I know that Ms. McLaughlin, you know, was getting frustrated, but I think we also have to be careful to look at, like, Prince William, also, their teachers work 90 hours less than ours do. They have a half hour shorter contract. You know, another school system has where they get to use their sick leave for retirement, or where they have incentives where they can pool sick leave and donate it to other. So I think there's never gonna be a real apples to apples. So I, I, t I hear what you're saying, but I'm saying when eggs are $8.99, what does my paycheck look like when I get home? And that's what people are thinking. I agree, there's a sales job that needs to be done and I know ERFC has been working their buns off to try to really be ambassadors of what an amazing program this is, but if you can't buy eggs at the grocery store, it doesn't matter. Um, I have one second, so. <laughs> You'll give it Get off my high, I'll donate it graciously back to That was so nice. <laughs> she gets it like. <laughs> there you go. Oh my God. Uh, Mr. Frisch, do you wanna go? Um, music to my ears about the strategic plan and what that spells for our budget uh, next year. I will say that every year during these budget conversations, I start the conversation, at least my part of it, talking about how disappointed I am that we're not digging into the non-new money um, that, uh, that we're being asked to approve. And so hopefully the strategic plan will help us realign, find savings, and invest in in the actual goals of that strategic plan. Um, I think one common thread that's kind of through a lot of the conversation here about uh, compensation and benefits is making our employees feel like we want them to be here and stay here. And part of that is, the, is basic customer service, right? <laughs> um, so what are the things we can do to make people feel like, if it's not increased pay, that we know we're helping them? One, um, you know, thing I've already talked about today is helping them sign up for public service loan forgiveness through the Department of Education. That's gonna save them a lot of money down the road. Um, another might be um, giving them money on their way in the door. There are any number of things that we could be doing that have negligible cost ramifications that show we're hearing them and that um, we care, right? Uh, it doesn't just have to be a conversation about the brass tax of what the, the paycheck is and what the benefits that go along with that paycheck are because there are a number of things that we could be doing. So um, I will certainly have a, um, uh, a, I have a budget question in about the public, public service loan forgiveness question and about how some ideas of helping to make that happen uh, for our employees, what those costs would be that may result in a uh, follow on motion. I don't think it'll be a budget amendment, but um, I will be in touch with colleagues as we move forward. And if I may, Mr. Frisch, it's, it's kind of like a chicken and egg conversation where we're talking about overall compensation for employees because in order for us to provide that level of that concierge service, I think, to our employees, when we look at the number of vacancies that we have across our operational departments, uh, it's important for us to be able to fill those vacancies so that we can provide that level of service that our employees deserve. Um, I, there's a recent book, and I don't have the, the title in front of me, but it, it, a friend sent it to me the other night about the hospitality industry and about those individuals who, you know, want, feel the need to go beyond. Uh, and it's, there's a, an innate uh, need in individuals in that particular uh, industry, and we see that in our HR staff as well. Uh, and all of our staff to go beyond and give more than what people expect. And so I think that raising the boat for everybody in terms of overall, overall compensation, I'm not talking about additional staff, I'm just talking about filling the vacancies that we have, will help us bring those staff members on board who can provide that concierge service that you're talking about.
Dr. Anderson, followed by Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Not to um, continue to belabor the point, I do want to echo what Ms. Corbett Sanders shared, which is what I asked last week. Um, we've got to provide that additional information. But I want to jump in and follow up on what Ms. Cohen said. I, would it be possible for this kind of um, stipend to help with college um, needs be a good educate Fairfax type of initiative or effort? I mean, who could speak to that? It, it could certainly be something that uh, Educate Fairfax takes a look at in terms of providing uh, scholarships for individuals who go through our Teach for Tomorrow right. program and come back. That's a conversation that I can have with um, uh, Lisa Youngblood Hall and uh, also talk with our executive director for the, the Educate Fairfax. Okay, thank you. And also, the storytelling of our work here, because I know very soon we're going to go present this to the Board of Supervisors, and we've already heard about this from some of our public. They still do not understand why is it that we're still requesting more dollars when we have a reduced enrollment. They're not getting the nuances of our needs being greater. And I know last time we talked about some sort of executive summary to kind of sell, sell the story, not sell the story, tell the story, are we going to be doing that? Is that something we need to take consensus on? Yeah, there's a, a, um, a flyer that basically unpacks enrollment of the, the different numbers, the CIP number, the budget number, um, and the other groups, and OCCR is working on that with budget right, right now. Thank you. And Dr. Reed, something you said just kind of stuck with me, that none of the departments came to you and said that there's a space to cost savings. I, I would encourage you to challenge them, to challenge themselves in some deeper reflection, because there's got to be something that they at least want to repurpose, if not necessarily let go of. I find it hard to believe that as much as we're putting in, that nothing can be taken out. And that's just not the funds, that's also the workload. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that when we have our new strategic plan in place to do the work that the community commits to us doing with the measurements you're going to agree on, we're going to have to repurpose those dollars. So mm -hmm. there's just no, no question about that. We'll probably have to take a department at a time and uh, as a cabinet go through that. What are we currently doing? Who's doing it? Um, what is the ROI, return right. on investment for it? And what if, if it's not getting us the ROI we want, then what do we do different? Mm -hmm. so. Because the challenge for us, people continuously say, you have a $3.5 billion budget, and yet you're asking for more. We don't get a chance to dig into the rest of it, just the new money. Um, family liaisons, I know last time we talked about doing some audits, because for me, that will inform my next steps in the budget process. Any ideas as to where we are with that information? I, we'll have that information. I know that we have the numbers of who are in which categories, and we'll have. I, I've seen it. If it hasn't been pulled together, it will be presented. Okay. And the advanced academics, the year three phase in of 1.6, now that this will have completed the entire um, project, I would love to get a sense of what are, what are going to be the expectations, what are going to be the mandatory, non optional expectations of what these. Um, local level four initiatives will look like at the schools. Not guidance, because guidance to me is optional. I can take it or leave it. But what is it that we're going to require? What are going to be our measurements? How are we going to say this is a successful investment of funds? Those are good questions, and I would want to query Dr. Presidio on those. Okay, I think that's my time. Ms. McLaughlin. I first want to make sure all my colleagues understand, and Dr. Dr. Reed, I absolutely understand that ERFC is not how you're going to attract new young teachers. Absolutely. What I want us to talk about is 6.4% annually is money per employee, plain and simple. And it doesn't go away because we've got staff recommending layering on a new step to a scale that the prior board in 2015 and the prior superintendent did all the analytics as noted with a consultant for more than a year because you have to make responsible decisions. Layering on this step 
without all the analysis and conversation that even happened today is irresponsible. It's fiscally irresponsible because you cannot take it away. It's going to be $4 million this year and every year from then on out. And that's what's got me so fired up, you guys, today. Because I look at this $3.5 billion budget, and if I can look at one line item that has been presented by our superintendent and her team, and the lack of looking into the fact that this is going to put us way above where, where we're trying to meet the market, but we're going to keep trying to meet the market every year. And that we're not having a holistic conversation about all the money that we pay an employee every single year. We didn't present it for them to understand it and see it. Please know I am not fighting to say we just have to keep ERFC as is locked in, you know, perpetuity. It's just you don't add a step onto the end of the scale until you've done this analysis. You engage your employees and you figure out what to do. That's my advocacy for today. And in terms of getting another consultant to come in and do our work for benchmarking, being competitive in the marketplace, Dr. Reed, please go talk with our county executive, Brian Hill, because to my knowledge, the board of supervisors and the county government, they're doing this every year to stay at and competitive with the market, and I'm not aware that they go out and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars with consultants, so I think we need to know that first. And if it turns out, since we're going to 3.30, is that correct? then I'd like another go back. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Sizemore-Heiser followed by Ms. Somesh. We should have just done three minutes. I, you know, I appreciate what Ms. McLaughlin is saying as well. And I think, I think it isn't, I mean, I do think that's one of our jobs, right, is to kind of look at the market each year and, and meet the market or, or make sure we're competitive in our market. So I think it is important to, to really look at our market. Um, and look at how we're going to be competitive with our market. And it's hard because it's, it's not a, you know, it's not, well, they pay 10, so we need to pay 10, right? It's, it's uh, salary and benefits, as, you know, as we all know and we've all heard, is very, very complicated. So it's hard to find that apples to apples comparison. But, you know, I think, I think Mr. Frisch made this point, but I apologize if it wasn't you. But, you know, we, uh, part of this meeting the market is what does a dollar buy you in our market versus the other markets? Right, you know, what is the cost of a house? What is the cost of eggs or the cost of living in Fairfax County versus Prince William or Loudoun County? And I think that's part of looking at our compensation package, right? Um, to be market competitive. So I think that's these these are important analysis, and I appreciate Ms. McLaughlin's questions. But what does it take to be competitive in our market? And what does it take to be competitive in a new environment where our demand is much greater than our supply? And both those things, you know, that's, for me at least, in my time on the board, this is a newer area and a growing need. So I just, you know, I think that is important to look at. I love the idea of looking at public loan forgiveness or other ways of incentivizing teachers. I wanted to mention, I brought up a couple times about um, funding for our strategic plan, you know, set-asides for our, but, you know, I brought this up last time, but what about set-asides or identification for AIR and our special education enhancement plan? Is the idea that we're going to relook at, our special education budget as part of that, or do we need to set aside funds? What is the plan for that? Because that's supposed to be coming to us in the spring. I'm sorry, I missed that. I'm, not that there aren't others, but if you could just restate that. Can I not have my time go while I restate the question? That would be helpful. I, yeah, I can restate the question. It was, is there money set aside for the AIR? Special education plan in addition to the two million at mid year and the two million moving forward for well, next year. If I could clarify, actually, what's the plan to implement it? More than just what's set aside. Like, what is the two million is not for this AR report, if I understand it, it's for the um, OCR. Correct. So, what's the plan? So I, go ahead, go ahead, Alice. Just to make a clarification on the budget piece for the AIR review in the current year's FY23 budget there was a $2 million placeholder. So that's recurring money. It's still been sitting there. It was pending the report that was coming to AIR. There were multiple work sessions for that. So that is there to make some determinations. That's what's been um, in the budget. But is that also for the enhancement plan? Because there's a strategic, is it for no. both of those or just one? No. Because they may not be the same. That's my Correct. question. So then in this year's budget proposal is the special ed compensatory services, which was another $2 million. And then we did uh, one-time money in the mid-year budget review of, I believe, 1.6 off the top of my head. So they are two separate things. 
So there, will, there will continue to be that two million dollars will be, is part of the base moving forward for the AIR recommendations, and I don't know if Dr. Boyd is on to talk about what that plan looks like, but we added that last year. That is part of the base for the coming year, and that two million will always be in there. So, but that still may not be from the enhancement plan, right? That's because we have OCR, we have AIR, and then we have what Dr. Boyd's work is. And so my question was specifically around Dr. Boyd's work. They're not the, they may overlap, but they're not the same. And, and we can get that. I don't, I don't have Dr. Boyd here with us today, but we can provide an update. I just, I asked for it last time too. So just as a reminder. Um, you know, just having said that, what I don't want to get to, and we did this with, our, you know, we, we I think we're very thoughtful with our AAP to put in a multi-year plan. Something I've been advocating for years is looking at staffing and special education programming for for thirty for many many years. It's been needed to look at. I don't want to do this work and then not have a thoughtful plan around it. Okay. So my time is up. Thank you. Ms. So mesh. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm happy to follow some of the living wage conversations, and I'm definitely leaning more into the fact that we still have to do something bigger here. Uh, and, and yes, we have to wait for our strategic planning process to get there, but I don't know that we have to wait for everything to be fixed through our strategic planning process. I think it might be keeping the can on things we could resolve now. So I guess I go back to the process conversation we were having earlier where I really would urge that staff can spend some time reflecting on the themes that have come out of today and last work session and just thinking about where we might want to move the budget differently. I'm inclined to make this a year where we just recommit to our staff. And the nice-to-haves that are on the budget, like maybe we need to reevaluate the urgency of some of those pieces. I, I just, you know, so I, I offer that for big picture thinking. Um, and colleagues, I think we need to reconsider. Ms. Burden, did I hear you correctly in saying that typically the board would um, improve upon their budget before presenting that to the Board of Supervisors? No. In Fairfax, we have not done that. Right, right, typically. but typically. But yes, all, all the other divisions I've worked in, it's usually done because we want to, you want to make sure that you're truly conveying your needs to the Board of Supervisors. So it's usually done between the superintendent's proposed and the school board proposed or advertised, which is what we call it. Right, so if we decide to align ourselves with what's best practice or what's common in the division, it would make sense. It's a, otherwise, it's a full waste of our time to spend two work sessions and potentially a third discussing what we think should be changed, but we're going to keep it, and then we're going to ask the Board of Supervisors for money to reflect something we know is not even going to be our final product. So I'd really urge our budget team maybe give some thought. And even if it's not formal, I would, ideally it wouldn't be formal amendments, but maybe another creative way to do it, something, I'd really appreciate that. Um, the other thing, just my remaining 30 seconds, I don't want to lose some of the conversation around uh, like the safe security officers. I was looking in this packet, I didn't find an explanation sheet for that specifically, but can someone please elucidate that? I didn't have time last time, but gosh, I don't know that I'm supportive without more understanding. And so we're looking at uh, five additional positions for our safety and security office uh, so that we can add to our individuals who are out on regular patrols. And then those five individuals would be focused on supporting our elementary schools. And so when there were uh, calls coming in from elementary schools, they would be uh, working very directly with the elementary schools. And then proactively, they would also work with our elementary schools in helping with their safety and security plans uh, within their buildings. Mm -hmm. I, I know that uh, there are some who have characterized them as SROs in the buildings, and they are not uh, SROs in the buildings. I've had that conversation with our chief of police uh, and with his staff, and he understands that we are not putting uh, SROs in the buildings. We are not putting armed individuals in our elementary schools, uh, but we are providing additional uh, security staff so that we can be um, more responsive to our, the needs of our elementary schools when there are situations that might arise. Are they from FCPD? Oh, because you, you just said you were talking to the chief, right? I, I explained to the chief because there has been swirl in the community that people have said that we're putting SROs in, and I was very clear. The chief 
didn't ask, but we were having a meeting, and I wanted to be very clear and proactive to say that you, you may have heard that we're putting SROs in, and we are not. Uh, there were no uh, recommendations to add SROs to the budget, and he was thankful. He had heard that, and of course, we hadn't had any conversations, um, but it was important for him and his staff to hear that we are not adding those SROs. They are not FCPD. Yeah, I appreciate the clarification. I think I'd add that to the category of just reevaluating urgency, you know, and we're bleeding on staff here. But um, so that brings me to my final point on the steps. Going back to what we were just discussing, I know it's going to be expensive. We all know it's going to cost money. Can we have some options in considering what possible paths forward, even if it's going to take 10 years, uh, to, to consider how we might remedy that? And we might decide none of them are feasible, but at least to understand and do the intentional work there. But thank you. That's my time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the frozen steps. Um, Ms. Barron, did you want another go? Okay. Um, Mr. Nakofax did not. Ms. Tolan? So I just wanted to um, kind of pull some of this stuff together. It's sounding to me like we have our strategic planning process well underway. We are hoping for our new strategic plan May time frame. Whatever day that is in May, I'm just going to make one up May 14th. It sounds like May 15th we should start the overall budget review and how it links to the strategic plan for the following years, right? Not, it's, it has to be out, you know, in addition to our regular budgeting process. Um, and, you know, I'm just throwing that out there for something to keep in mind for timing, because um, it's a lot of work. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just throw out as a member of staff, I'm not gonna remember what year it was, but there were a number of times where we were just told, here's your budget, um, figure out if you had mm -hmm. to do your work and you were reducing your budget by 20%, what would it look like? Mm -hmm. What would you be giving up? We had to explain everything. If you reduce it by 10%, uh, I mean, that's not unheard of. Mm -hmm. You know, we've done it before, we can do it again. Um, but that doesn't get at the prioritization. Mm -hmm. That's just across the board, right? I think we want, want to be more thoughtful about which areas maybe we reduce more than others, et cetera. But anyway, that's a lot of conversation. Um, and uh, we are asking people to look and talk very heavily over the next month about potential amendments based on the discussions that we've been having so that we can do what uh, Ms. Burden is asking, is to really try to have the, the amendments squared away during this portion of our budgeting process and not wait until the advertised budget. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, with my few seconds remaining, I would just ask, um, can you talk a little bit about the budget questions? I've had a number of board members just ask, you know, we submit budget questions. What's the time frame for generally turning the requests around? You know, what can we be expecting over the next couple of weeks? Well, it depends on the complexity of the question. I mean, basically, we get the questions from you all that are entered in the budget question uh, Google Doc, or your aide does it, and then we distribute it to the appropriate leadership team member to provide an answer. Some of them are really complicated and have multiple parts. Those are going to take a while. Uh, some are pretty simple, like what's the costing of athletic trainers. We were able to, you know, get that pretty quickly. Um, it it depends. And yeah, and we work based on the prioritization. Even if it's complicated and has multi parts, if it says priority one for you know an, a, an upcoming vote, then we'll then everybody knows that you know we no lollygag and get that done. Okay, thank you. I think you know there's many things that have been talked about from you know maybe even relooking at the RFC, which. I mean, these are these are big, big questions, and I, I think I just kind of want to bring us back to this year and where we are. And those things are not going to get done, I, or nor are we going to have those conversations. Um, and we are in this transition year, and Dr. Reed is looking and trying to learn about the system, the needs, um, assessing everything. So. Um, just wanted to remind everyone of that because I, I, we, we just had so many ideas today and I know those people who are listening maybe on, online or, you know, could be wondering too, where are we going to go with all of this? Um, 
Let's do, I would suggest a one minute if you want it, if you don't want it, but um, we don't have much more time than that today. So with that, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Okay. Ms. Keys Gamara. Okay. Ms. Cohen. She's taking it. Ever going to pass it? Um, really quickly, one thing that I think uh, Dr. Reed referenced, but I would um, like to bring up is our high school, our principal and assistant principal salaries. I know um, I had the opportunity to um, be in one of my schools with somebody who happens to be on the Elementary School Principals Association board. And um, for all of you who haven't seen it, um, we should get it sent. I think it went to Ruchna, but not to all of us. So maybe um, the salary scales that they gave a comparison for principals, you would have just gotten it, but principals and APs um, across. And the difference in number of days worked, um, difference in how many um, like vacation days they're giving, difference in salaries. I mean, oh my gosh, it's huge. So I know that we're in the weeds right now with all, everybody, everybody needs it, but I also wanna make sure we're not forgetting um, our principals in the conversation too. And I understand what Stella's saying about keep it focused, but to Abrar's point, you know, I think, and maybe strategic planning will be a piece of that, but if we say this is what F we want FY24 to move us forward instead of chipping away in an iceberg a little bit at a time, are we ha making budgets that really try to eat? Um, because all the work you guys did to get us and now we're behind again, like do we need to have those years where we're just taking a big bite of the elephant? Um, anyway, I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Frisch, followed by Dr. Anderson. Just, just very quickly, when you're putting together that one-page summary, I, I would love to get a sense of kind of what we've been talking about here. Again, it's not going to be as significant as it could be in out, in out years, but something in terms of what was our approach with this budget, because there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. There's not a deep investment into any other section. But if you could at least give a little bit of that information in terms of what the overall approach was in getting to this um, budget for this year. Thank you. Hey, no, sorry. We're not paying attention. I thought somebody was going to. Answer. <laughs> oh, to answer, yeah. yes. We, we, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it wasn't me, so. I was yeah, no, yes. We, we, I, I shouldn't be, you know, touching the button, I guess. But uh, yes, we will, we will work on that. We, we talked at that last work session and said that budget staff does a good job of bringing the facts forward, the numbers, and all of that, but it takes all of us to create that narrative for why we're here, and that will be part of that one pager. Agree. Um, uh, Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pekarski, to your point, I do want to make sure, in case there is any question about why I've persisted the entire work session on this issue on the adding a step to the scales, is because it is a $4 million decision this year. It will be a $4 million decision next year, and it, you, it doesn't go away. And I've hammered at this because without a holistic, comprehensive analysis of how we're going to make this fiscal decision for employee compensation, we, the board, and I believe the superintendent, and I believe this division will be fiscally irresponsible for not having been doing the analysis before we leap and add it to the end. So I know it's been painful for some of you to listen to me hammering it. It's because I am still in shock that you cannot make a decision of adding an extra step to the scale and not have done the other comparative analysis to determine, are we going to do both? Are we going to then be compensating and at a cost to the system, at a cost to the other things that so many of us say we also need to invest in? It all matters. So I really appreciate everybody's patience today. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser? Other than the same, I have not seen that email yet, but I'll share it with the board if I see it, about um, what Ms. Cohen mentioned about 
principals and assistant principal compensation. Um, I think I think we're in a real crossroads here because um, with a new superintendent and in the middle of a strategic plan, I think the board is hungry for a lot of re-envisioning. And I think that's what you're hearing, Dr. Reed, is, is the need for a lot of re-envisioning and a need for understanding if we're layering on top why and what are we doing and, and understanding for the bigger picture that's in the document that was posted, I think, last night. And so um, I think that would help in this budget process. You know, I, and I've talked to you earlier this year that I feel like this is this hybrid year, as I keep calling it, right, as we're bringing you on, as we're, um, you know, reimagining FCPS, you know, with a strategic plan, trying to build towards that, but yet still keep the ship afloat. What does that look like this year? And I think I feel like, you know, some of these questions are trying to understand how does what we're adding, how is this keeping the ship afloat, but it's going to impact us longer term, and how does this fit with the sort of grander vision of what we're doing, and how do we make sure what we're doing this year can fit with the vision we haven't finished creating yet without adding obligations that we may not want in the future, right? But also addresses, I think, what many of us have addressed as long-standing needs that need to be addressed. Um, I think you'd be a magician to answer my question, so I'm not going to ask you to answer it, but I think that's what I feel, that feel the tension here is. And I don't quite know how to get us there, but that's the tension I see. I just wanted to name it. Ms. Omesh, followed by... Go ahead, Ms. Omesh. Okay. So I guess we're $36.4 million in savings above what we had expected because of employee leave or um, empty positions, et cetera. We ought to reinvest that amount in our employees because the reason these positions are empty is part of the problem. Um, so, with that said, I just I guess I want to hear from staff like what are the next steps from this conversation? I'd really hope again that we're reflective on the conversations and then rethinking where we're moving forward in a tangible way. Like I don't want to show up for the next work session and start off where we start again in the same place. So that's number one. I'd like to hear about before I stop. And then number two, we might benefit from even just pausing and doing a little bit of analytics around like the in and outflow of staff and whether we've seen, when we've seen dips and ups, ag tracking that against like when we've done step, step freezes or when we've done increases in MSA or other things and, and just looking at so that the data can speak to us. I mean, we're making assumptions about like what's beneficial for recruiting or reten and retention and what's not and sure, our intuition will take us far. I think that certain things are obvious. Uh, but that might also be useful. I don't know, staff, if that's something you guys have, look at, or perhaps is something we can work on. Um, those are my two pieces. I'd love to hear feedback, and that's my time. Well, the, the lapse in turnover or the base savings are already reinvested. Without that negative number in the budget, um, reducing salaries um, and benefits, our ask would be $36 million more. So those are already reinvested. But in everything, right? Not just staff. That's what my point was. Like in all kinds of programs that we're trying to support. Like that money is being used for everything that's on the list, right? It, it's just reducing the, the ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. of, you know. I'm, I'm just saying since it came from staff, it should go to staff. But... I hear you. Obviously, it's part of the full amount of money, yeah. And it reduces air compensation. I mean, if you look at air, I don't have the numbers right with me, but I think air compensation package is like 120, 130. And if you, if you didn't have that, then air ask would be like 160. I hear yeah. Yeah, 128. So it would be 36 million more. It's that base savings that's working against the total. Mm -hmm. No, I hear you on that. And then there was the other piece. And again, the other piece again, I'm sorry. Oh, just um, doing a reflective look at at what point have we had in and outflow of staff compared to like when we've made certain adjustments. So, so we're going to take that look at the retention over time uh, and that, that uh, turnover data. And then we can do a, a crosswalk between that turnover data and then what happened in that particular year. Yeah, just might help us know what levers, you know, matter. Okay, thank you. 
Um, okay, and with that, um, I think we have concluded the budget work session, and I'll give it back to Chair Tolan to give us some reminders and close us out. Yes, so I think um, what we'll do from here is we talked earlier, you know, we'll uh, take this information, we'll speak with Dr. Reed again and with our budget team and um, figure out you know, some of the best ways to move forward and getting everyone's amendments and taking a look at everything. What I do want to um, just remind people again, I think Ms. Kwiatkowski did a pretty good job earlier and uh, Chair Sizemore Heiser talked a little bit about this too. We need to keep in mind that, and this is how we constructed our work in October and in November, we need to keep in mind that this is kind of sort of a, a bridge year um, with a new superintendent and in, while we are constructing a strategic plan. So a lot of the very specific kinds of things that we talked about today will fall into those various buckets, strategic buckets that we talked about, whether it's you know, workforce, um, hiring and retention, um, student wellness, student academic success. And so um, we will wanna be at a strategic level with this budget in particular um, and hit on some of these big topic areas and then that we're gonna to have to continue to think strategically on how these very specific items are taken care of in, in budgets as we move forward in the future. So with that, I appreciate everyone's time today. McLaughlin. Yes, I just have a quick process question. So Dr. Reed, today we got presented the total career earnings for master's level teacher scale. But it's my understanding from talking to other board members that your team is proposing a step at the end of every pay scale. Is that correct? So has the board been provided that data on total career earnings for each of the scales that you want us to approve the four million? And if not, can we get that? Yes, we will uh, provide the, those, uh, the data for all scales. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks again to everyone for your um, thoughtful participation, and we will adjourn this particular board budget hearing. Okay. Good